this year, for the first time, the London Marathon is a royal occasion. Prince of Wales will be starting the marathon well protected against the morning rain which has been quite heavy. It's fairly cool, very little wind and conditions for running a marathon fairly good. The London Marathon began only six years ago. A modern contribution to the calendar of great British sporting events, some with routes going back well over a century. The Grand National, the boat race, the Derby, the FA Cup final, all unique British occasions. Born perhaps out of eccentricity, but the envy of the rest of the world. The London Marathon now stands proudly alongside those splendid events. An annual journey through the streets of the capital city, which attracts people from every part of the globe. The great athletes, the people who run for fun, the disabled, a challenge for all, in which over 80,000 wanted to take part, and more than 20,000 will start. A world record field, and already the five London marathons so far have won a special place in the sporting history of the nation. After 26 miles, 385 yards, and Beardsley of America ties with Stevenson of North. <laughs> Hugh Jones pounds his way to the finish now, the fastest marathon ever run in the United Kingdom. New British record for Joy Smith. Mike Brennan, storming home. Finest victory. Yet. A terrific finish by Greta Weiss. <laughs> A very, very fine run indeed. It wins the London Marathon for Charlie Spetty. Certainly, Ingrid Christensen goes now into the record books. The new United Kingdom all-colours record for Steve Jones, who finishes really strong. 
striding home. The girl who won last year wins again this year, and this time with a new world best. And Peter Howe is going to finish this remarkable 19-year-old from Cambly. Life doesn't get much tougher than that. And Peter Hull being introduced to His Royal Highness. Peter Hull celebrating uh, this year the 25th anniversary of the British Sports Association for the Disabled and leading a group of 45 wheelchair wonders. Great Britain's Man of the Year last year. Explaining... Uh, that uh, specially manufactured arms to push him along and a, and a real racer's wheelchair. Loves this race and has actually raced over 100 miles as well as the marathon distance. There's Kay McShane, the first lady in 1984 and 1985, a secretary from Cork in Ireland. Good track athlete too. Competes in the paraplegic Olympic Games. Denise Smith is there too, next to her. The third lady in the 1985 Free sports for the Association for the Disabled, and it's a big celebration year for them. There are more than 80 runners running on their behalf. Here they are warming up, and they uh, they regard this as a very important race in their calendar. They've been training, and there's uh, right in the middle of the picture there, last year's winner, Chris Hallam, who went number one, just adjusting his number there, the tough guy from Wales, and... Uh, He's going off to the States to look into the manufacture of even faster wheelchairs. They're really, uh, they're really looking into the technology of this event. Also wants to take part in invitation races in the United States of America. 45 of them on wheelchairs, and uh, it's a very keenly anticipated event. Alan Krauss there, the uh, referee who's in charge of the wheelchair wonders, and uh, is uh, very proud of the fact they're celebrating their jubilee. With Chris Brasher, the race organizer, and he says that this year we've, al we've almost got the 20,000 together. And uh, I'll bet they're discussing the weather and how that's going to affect the wheelies. And as a matter of fact, they're worried about the weather because they say it makes them slip, especially on the cobblestones. So it's a problem for them. They'll, uh, they'll be about five minutes slower than they anticipated. The problem of keeping warm too. Chris, right in the middle. Remember the great battle he had with uh, Jerry O'Rourke from Dublin? Well, the Welsh man wants a good race again. Real tough guy. And preparations for the start. A magnificent royal occasion. Just getting a bit of discipline, coming under starter's orders. Fortunately, there's not too much wind about, you can see, uh, and that's one good thing. And the pity of this weather is that it will only affect those who are the slowest. Those who are out there four or five hours. For the rest of them, for those who are out there for a couple of hours, it's not going to be too bad. The forecast is that it'll clear around 12 o'clock. Let's hope it does just that. 45 wheelchair athletes. The winner's time last year, Chris Hallam. Two hours, 19 minutes. Jerry Rook has done it in two hours, 12, the Dublin man. So it's a rematch for them. 1986, London Marathon, underway. Yeah. Chris being uh, left just a little at the start, but he knows it's a marathon and not a sprint race. And of course, when we see the wheelchair athletes get away, Remember, too, that there are many other disabled athletes taking part. There are the deaf and the blind. There are mentally handicapped athletes taking part this year as well. And uh, today is one of those great occasions where there's a tremendous outpouring of the British public, and many of the uh, physically and mentally handicapped will benefit enormously from the London Marathon, as they always do. Something like £5 million may well be raised. So it's uh, a super occasion. But these fellas are athletes, and that's how they want to be regarded. And uh, they just want a real tough race. And Jerry O'Rourke wears three. Chris Hallam wears one. He's in second place at the moment. 
and he won't want him to get away too far. But the wheelchair athletes on their way. So there we are, the 20,000 or so that follow them, the runners that make yesterday's Everest seem not just possible, but even likeable. And they'll be going all the way through the streets of London, and in particular, they'll be searching out the heart of London's East End. Marathon route follows the line of the Thames. In fact, it has been said the course uses the river as a running rail and takes in some of the famous sights that make London such a major tourist attraction. The finish is over Westminster Bridge, which first spanned the Thames over two centuries ago. And in the background, the stately lines of the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben, towering some 300 feet above the runners. The most welcome sight on the course at the end of more than 26 miles. Just a mile before the majestic open spaces of the Mall, with Buckingham Palace beckoning in the far distance. Approaching the halfway stage, the unmistakable outline of Tower Bridge. The bridge introduced by the streets and docks of East London, where the bands are already playing at the impromptu street parties. Six miles, the Royal Naval College. And nearby, a diversion around the famous tea clipper, the Cutty Sark. And at the start, with the great adventure about to begin, the thousands assemble in Greenwich Park on Blackheath. More than 10,000 queuing to go over each of the two starting lines. This will be the start, just outside Greenwich Park, for the veterans, the virgins, who are the first-time marathon runners, and the ladies in the women's race. On the far side of the common, where Prince Charles is uh, talking to some of the competitors, will be the fast start. And in the background there, Seiko of Japan, who's one of the favourites for the race, together with his teammate, Kanhai. Meanwhile, David Davis is our man at the start. He's been talking to some of the thousands of competitors. John Hampton, now where are you from? I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, USA. And what do you think of the English weather? Uh, typical, from what I've heard, anyhow. Uh, cold and rainy. And you seem to be well prepared, though. Uh, yeah, I'm going to discard this when I start running. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, Are you looking forward to it? Yes, yes. Uh, I want to beat last year's time. If I can, I was five hours and 10 minutes last year, and I want to make about 4.30 this year. This a genuine running festival. A carnival, which has attracted competitors not only from all over this country, but from some 27 nations, we believe, overseas. Of course, we've got the uh, two starts in the major marathon, the wheelchair athletes already on their way. And as well today, we've got a mini marathon for the first time ever, in which the competitors, all the youngsters from the London boroughs, will start at Tower Bridge and run about three miles, about 5,000 metres, to finish at Westminster Bridge. Not following the absolute line of the uh, finish of the marathon, they miss out the mile, but they go straight along the embankment and finish at the normal finish. There, by the way, is Veronique Maro, who is the British uh, number one in the marathon, standing next to Greta Weitz in the white cap from Norway, the favourite today. And the twins there, Paula Fudge and Anne Ford, first and third in the Commonwealth Games in 1978 in the 5,000 metres. Hannah and Louise Selwood and their parents, Mr. and Mrs. Selwood. And it's Mrs. Selwood who's running. That's right. Well, what, what's he doing? What's the old man doing? Why doesn't he take part? Take part? Got more sense, I think. <laughs> and what do you think about her taking part? Oh, well, second year now, so uh, I just removed the brain before last year and not put it back. How did you get on last year? <laughs> oh, um, I thought it was longer than it, it really was, you know. Um, I've never done a marathon before, but... Last uh, year, no. Yeah. What preparations have you made? Um, running for quite a long time, you know. What sort of distances? Um, up to about 20 miles a time. So, uh, so you think you're better prepared? No, <laughs> you're never better prepared. <laughs> That's so true, especially at a moment like this, with the start just minutes away at half past nine. Well, we've got athletes uh, at the very top level, the elite, who are running for places in the Commonwealth Games and the European Championship Marathon later this season. There are two places available, first and second in the London Marathon last year, Steve Jones and uh, Charlie Spedding have been pre-selected. Spreading will go for the Commonwealth Games Marathon and Steve Jones will go for the European. But there are four places left for the elite runners to compete for. And of course, the girls, the British girls, are all competing for places in the Commonwealth and the European teams. A blog from York. Yeah. Conditions suit you? Well, uh, the last two, year, uh, last two years I've done it have been nice weather, you know. But I don't mind this weather. It's a bit disappointed for crowds, though, isn't it? And, I mean, what preparations have you made? About 50 miles a week, you know, since about January. I've been running now for about four years. And what time of the day do you do your training? How do you fit it in? Um, my lunchtime, uh, an hour at work, so I can get back to work and get a shower, you know, no problem. And then I go out on a night twice a week, I go with the club one night, you know. But I wished it was like last year, the weather last year. But it's a day you're going to enjoy? Yes, yes. The first one was the best, 82. I did in a 4 hour 31. And, uh, Could you beat that today? Well, I did 84 and I got a 337. So, I don't know. You know. Are you, you're getting a bit older. I'm 51. What other sport can boast a sight like this? Thousands and thousands queuing up in Greenwich Park for the slower start. The veterans, the virgins, the first-timers, and the ladies. And by the way, over four million pounds is raised for charity every year in the London Marathon. Yeah. What other sport will change people's lives as this may well do today? Okay, Here are the youngsters on Tower Bridge. The age gap this year spans 71 years. This is the mini marathon. Athletes gathered from 33 London boroughs. All age groups, there's the 11, 12 and 13s, the 14 and 15s and the under 17s in three races, up to 72 representing each of the London boroughs. And there's a lot of fine athletes amongst them too. A lot of them already established in athletic clubs. And our own Bob Wilson having a natter with some of them there and these kids are looking forward to it as much as anybody. What's your name? Stuart Moore. 
Where are you from, Stuart? I know, you're from Croydon, Coulston. You're representing... Croydon. Which? You're representing Croydon. Uh, do you belong to a club? Yes, yeah, sorry, Wiggles. And do you fancy this rain or not? It's terrible, isn't it? Well, it's pretty good for marathon running, but I don't really like it. All right, let me have a chat with your friend here. Yeah, Who are you? Philip Goodfellow. Sorry? Philip Goodfellow. Just come forward a bit, Philip. Where are you from? Point, uh, Sussex. I used to come from Boynton, though. Yeah, and do you belong to a club? Yeah. Uh, Cambridge and SLH. Are you nervous about this morning? No, not really. It's a fun run, isn't it? It is a fun run. Three miles is no trouble to you, is it? No. It's exciting, though, isn't it? Yeah. Let's have a word with somebody else. Come on through, my darling. Just come through to the front here. Uh, here are. Now then, what's your name? Lisa. Where are you from, my darling? Croydon. From Croydon? Yes. And do you think you'll manage three miles all right? Yes. Is mum and, are mum and dad here? Yes. Good. You're going to enjoy yourself. Yes. I hope you do anyway. Have a good time, everybody. Well, in the London Marathon, of course, you've got the unknown and the famous. Hardly needs naming entertaining Prince Charles. And he today, Jimmy Savile, running his 50th marathon. See you later, boss. God bless. See you later. Just a couple of minutes to go before the starting flag drops. The field gun of the Royal Artillery will boom out the starting signal. If you don't know Blackheath Common, well, the athletes start on either side of the common. This is the blue start, the first start, and those athletes in front competing for places and prize money at the head of the field. Joyce Smith, winner twice of the London Marathon, now retired with the Royal Starter. As the Prince drops the flag, the starting gun will boom out. About 90 seconds before the start. Couldn't have a better advisor on marathon running than our first lady of uh, marathon, Joyce Smith. And only just retired, I may say. Really set all the standards for the women to follow in Great Britain's athletic team. Started life as 1500 meter runner and 3000 meter runner, and then developed as our number one marathon runner. So the athletes called forward an anxious wait. Of course, a lot of the fun runners have been out there for two to three hours already, and there's not very much shelter. Blackheath or in Greenwich uh, Park, which has been the main problem for them, really, keeping warm. And actually, the wind seems to be getting up a little bit. Just over half a minute to go to the start. The elite wait on the far side of the common. The starters on the red start are all ready to go as well. And so they're in the final countdown now with about 15 seconds to go. The first Royal London Marathon. And straight away, they go very quickly to establish their places for a roundabout, which comes up after about five to six hundred yards. The leaders, of course, are always in touch with the clock, and pace is all important to them, as indeed it is for the athletes in the front row, because starting too fast is the greatest crime of all. Chris Bracia had a word of advice to the fun runners yesterday, which was very well based. And those are the fun runners, the veterans, which was very well based, his advice. He said, if you're running too fast for the first half of the race, to talk to your companions, you are running too fast. 
actually, I think, uh, Brendan Foster, you could extend that advice to 20 miles. I think these days that's absolutely true because uh, I think nowadays the marathon is a race where you get to 20 miles and according to Charlie Spedding, uh, who's an Olympic bronze medalist and winner of the previous London Marathon, he says that the events change nowadays. He says it's an event where you go faster from, from 20 miles to the finish, whereas the evolution of the event, it was who slowed down the least. So talking to each other, they should almost be not going too fast so that they could do that. But this is the bit I like, these, these boys with the banners. I don't know whether they carry them all the way, but you see that one every year. Hello, Alderney. And I didn't think there would be enough people in Alderney or runners in Alderney to carry that banner, but there they are. Hello, Alderney 86. We'll see you next year. And I think, Brendan, those gates may be the salvation of these, uh, these fun runners because it slows them down. There's no way they can squeeze through this bottleneck. They may have liked the idea of getting away on the charge, but this is the disciplined approach. And it says the snail's there, and in fact they are, and they're going to be passing that point for the next 10 minutes or so. But nearly 20,000 runners on their way. 10,000 at each of the two starts, and this is the fast start. And by the way, they merge after about three and a half miles, just beyond the Woolwich Barracks, the famous home of the Royal Artillery come down some dual carriageway there in Woolwich and uh, the barriers are set across the centre of the road and after that they merge and it becomes one race. Looking at these athletes, well, it's worth reminding you the oldest competitor this year is 81 years old Pat Riley of South East London. And the oldest uh, woman competitor this year, as last year, Carla Alley, who does most of her training at about 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, she's age 72. Pat Riley started life as a sprinter, so there's a hope for a lot of these fellas. He ran against Harold Abrahams in 1924 and uh, is a very sprightly 81 indeed. You said in the opening about this rivaling the other great events in Britain, but a thing for me that makes a little bit of difference for this is when you watch the Cup Final or when you watch the Grand National or when you watch the Test Match, People don't know people who play in the Test match or in the Cup final, but everybody in Britain knows somebody who's running here today. And that's what I think makes this event a little bit special, because everybody's got a friend at work or a relation or somebody they know who runs. And I think that you know, gives everyone who's watching this thing a little bit of a personal insight. Nobody I know ever sees anybody though run. Now with the royal approval, that's, uh, that's lovely. Blue start. And you may notice there, the athletes are just checking their watches as they go through, because, uh, well, one thing they always point out to you afterwards is that uh, when they cross the finishing line, the time is wrong for the slower athletes, because, of course, they've had to queue for several minutes to get through the start. Some of the 614 accountants and uh, 102 agriculturists and 104 architects and 177 doctors and 2,604 engineers. 77 estate agents amongst them. 341 farmers. 66 farmers. 473 housewives, probably the hardest working of the lot. And everybody that was talking to me at the pasta party last night said, we've got to give a tremendous vote of thanks to the wives who make all this possible. And they do. Tremendous support. And here are 473 of them running in the London Marathon. 772 policemen and 11 politicians. Sixty-seven taxi drivers wondering whether they've found the right route. Prince Charles clearly fascinated by this special occasion. The Royal Seal of Approval on the London Marathon. And ahead, after 26 miles, the statue, the Victoria statue in front of Buckingham Palace. Queen Victoria. And really, there'll be a lot of runners who will be making, well, one or two ribald comments about Queen Victoria because she's responsible for the extra 385 yards they run in the marathon beyond 26 miles. 
the 1908 Olympic Games, uh, the distance was changed in order for the finish to be in front of the Royal Box. And that is the 385 yards, which has now become the traditional distance. The first mile has been pretty quick, by the way. It's four minutes at 51 seconds. Uh, but that's not suicidally quick. And by the way, if the pictures are a little different than usual, we have not got a tracking shot today on the motorcycle camera at the moment. Uh, that picture is transmitted to the helicopter. The signal goes to the helicopter and is then reflected back, but we haven't got the helicopter flying because of the low uh, cloud ceiling. It's got to fly at 1,000 feet, and so far, the Civil Aviation Authority haven't given permission for the BBC helicopter to fly, so we haven't got a tracking shot with the leaders. We're just on fixed cameras, and we haven't got a helicopter shot as yet. But the weather forecast is that uh, about half past 11 to 12 o'clock, uh, the weather should improve and the uh, cloud ceiling lift. Just a word for the organisation at the start. We always re remember those that organise the finish, which looks tremendous. But a uh, whole lot of people got that start underway. John Herring was uh, responsible for it. And a, and a tremendous number of uh, people from Cambridge Harriers in particular, although I know I, sh I should forget a, a lot of other athletic clubs. I think Blackheath are involved. But they do a tremendous job in organising that start. And it was interesting that uh, there was great discipline because uh, next year... It's, uh, it's the ambition of the Marathon Association to have official world records, so it's got to be absolutely on the dot. Uh, as the chimes ring out, so the gun goes, and there was a well-disciplined start, and well done to all those that organised that start. Just, just confirmation that uh, the leading man went through the mile in 4.51, and the leading uh, woman was Greta Weitz of Norway, who was through in 5.28 for the first mile, a sensible pace. That is a sensible pace, and obviously Greta Vates is the favourite for this race. She's come here in very, very good form, and she's looking forward to this year being her last year of marathon running. She's been 16 years running internationally for, for Norway, and uh, maybe she's had enough, but she's looking forward to the European Championships in Stuttgart this year, and then the New York Marathon, and she's considering seriously bowing out. But London here is Greta's, probably her one of her last chances to run a personal best time, and I think she's fit enough to do that. What a marvellous piece of organisation this is. There's no other marathon like this in the world. 33% more runners than the second biggest marathon, the New York Marathon. A tribute to the organisation and planning of the race director, Chris Brasher, and the course director, John Disley, who's absolutely meticulous in measuring the course. And by the way, it's slightly different this year uh, due to uh, changes in Dockland, but of course the distance has been uh, meticulously measured, and there is a blue line for the athletes to follow. And that blue line takes the short route all the way, which uh, really is designed to uh, make sure that they don't take shortcuts. In fact, it takes the short line, so the decision's made for them all the way through. Now, these uh, athletes are going through the start some 10 minutes after the leaders. And that blue line, Tempro Paint, invented for the London Marathon, and put down over 500 hours of work, put down at, uh, at midnight last night and organized for the day. They needed uh, dry weather. Now the mini marathon. The three miles from Tower Bridge to Westminster Bridge, the 33 London boroughs. Those wearing green and gray, they are the 11, 12, and 13 year olds. Those wearing uh, yellow and white, well, they're the uh, 14 and 15-year-olds. They start a little later, they start at 9.50. And then at 10 o'clock, the 17-year-olds who wear orange <laughs> and navy. What a thrill this must be, to be running part of the London Marathon course at such an early age and actually finishing at Westminster Bridge across the actual London Marathon finish. And it was the organisers of uh, recreation in the London boroughs that really took responsibility for this, as well as the teachers, but the teachers being in dispute made life a little difficult, except for good old South London College in Tooley Street in the Inner London Education Authority, who made it possible for uh, these kids to get changed. And look at them batting out of there. They've gone off far too fast, I can tell you now. But the, uh, the greens and greys are away. This is the group that start at 9.40. 12 in each age group. And some of these uh, youngsters were on Blue Peter in the week, and boy, were they looking forward to it. Just to be part of the London Marathon, to represent their boroughs. 
2,000 youngsters, and every London borough is represented. So the Mini's on their way, and they're still are pouring along the road. Uh, that's just about the mile marker as they turn left on the faster start. What is quite clear is Royal Highness Prince Charles, as the official starter this year, has enjoyed himself this morning. And he's now talking to David Davis. Um... Well, it absolutely is. It would be nice if the weather was a bit better, <laughs> wouldn't it? Uh, do you, what do you but think is the most impressive thing here? I, I think it's the sheer enthusiasm and, uh, and the fun that everybody seems to have. That's a great thing. And it's very marvellous. It brings out the best in people. Do you find it surprising there could be 90,000 people wanting to take part? Um, well, I, perhaps it's just grown in popularity, hasn't it, over the last, whatever it is, five years since it started? I mean, I, I think people are delightfully demented, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all good fun, that's the great thing. You wouldn't be tempted yourself? Well, I don't know, it's just the practice. I think I could do it every day. <laughs> Thank you, sir. One day. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> well, the leaders are now through two miles. The time, 9.46. The first mile in 4.51, the second mile in 4.55. And really, it's about economy in the early stages. But that's a good place, that's the kind of place that they intended to undergo. Unfortunately, I feel like everyone else, we're not a bit disappointed that we're not able to see the pictures of the leaders, but I think you explained the technicalities of that. So we'll have to just wait on the mile times coming in, but 49 minutes for the first 10 miles was the plan, and the first two miles have gone in quite comfortably within that time limit. Well, several miles ahead of the athletes, our first fixed camera point, which is at Cutty Sock. Now, in case you've just uh, switched on, that will be the first time we can pick up the leaders because of the weather conditions. Uh, helicopter is not flying because of the uh, low cloud base. We've got to fly at 1,000 feet to get the signals back from the uh, tracking motorcycles and also from the heli-tele, as it's known, the camera in the helicopter. We're hoping to be airborne between 11 o'clock and half past, but we can't pick up the leaders now because of the weather until they approach the Cuddy Sark, which is around the six-mile mark. I love, I love the sign that said, be home for lunch, Mum. But these are the hopefuls, 40% of them, incidentally, over the age of 40. The age group moving up. The super vets are on parade today, and uh, they're looking for great times. Veterans Athletics is part of the boom of the athletic scene and the over 40s are here to show their stuff and they really are in great form you'll see some tremendous races today hello pen yesterday's fitness fad is today's running boom and this creates london's biggest street party there'll be about a million people en route there would have been more had it not been raining target for the housewife and the business executive just to finish a marathon and they know that the London Marathon is their greatest hope because they'll be cheered all the way helped on their way meanwhile ahead at uh, Tarbridge the second mini marathon about to start the second of the uh, minutes is about to go off here. I've got about 600 youngsters. Now, you're aged between what, 15, 16? 15 and 16. And where are you from? Croydon. What age are you? Uh, 15. You're 15, yeah. yeah. And you're from Haringey? Uh, no, I'm 15. Do you belong to the Haringey Club? Yeah. Are you excited by this this morning? Well, I am, and I'm not because of the cold weather like. Let me just see if I can find one of the... Uh, oh, here we are. You're from Greenwich. What's your name? Lucy. Do you run for a Greenwich club? No. Have you ever, do you think you'd be all right on this three miles? Yeah. Not it's not very long. It's not far. You'd have preferred to run the 26, would you? No way. Never run that. Can I have a word with you, my love? Yeah. You're from Hounslow? Yeah. And what's your name? Mandy Dowling. Have you got mum and dad watching? Or yeah, watching. watching. Are they on the route? No, they're watching, I'm telling you. Are you looking forward to it? Yeah. Good. I hope you all enjoy yourselves anyway. Have a good time. You're off in about two minutes, I think. Don't edge forward and let me get out of the way. 
Well, they're leaving in two minutes, and Prince Charles is leaving Blackheath Common now in the Royal Helicopter. He's flying back to Highgrove, his home in Gloucestershire. But in fact, he'll be having a look, it seems, along the marathon route uh, for the first, uh, well, for the next half hour of the race. And by the way, if you're wondering why the Royal Helicopter is flying and the BBC helicopter is not, and therefore we've lost our shots, uh, that Royal Helicopter will be flying at 500 feet. But of course, for television purposes, we need a higher cloud base than 1,000 feet for the pictures from the heli -tally and also for the signals. We still haven't got any news of the leaders yet, apart from the two-mile time, 9.46. 4.51 the first mile, the second mile in 4.55. And Chris Brasher has been uh, back through us by radio. Um, it's quite good out there, apparently. The conditions are quite uh, reasonable. And the wind, 1.4 behind. It's rather unusual, actually, to get a following uh, wind measurement in a marathon, but uh, no detail spared. Actually, uh, I, I met John Disley last night and he was carrying the wind gauges and I thought it was really amusing that they're now going to use wind gauges to measure marathon times because uh, the wind can be blowing a gale behind you and blowing a gale in your face at other points in the course. And I think that it's technology gone mad when you start using uh, wind gauges to measure marathons because it's, it's all about how fast the guy's going, how fast he, how, how well he feels. And the conditions, apart from the wind, can have much more significant effect than the wind. But technology's taking over the marathon, Ron. I think so, yeah. Uh, they have to have six wind gauges, incidentally. They're quite specific about it. And they've only followed the, what the Japanese have been doing for some considerable time. I suppose it's all right on the out and back courses. Incidentally, our big race, the wheelchair boys, are together. Chris Hallam and Jerry O'Rourke, number one and two last year. The battle between Wales and Ireland already underway. 45 starters in their race. Chris on the left. Marathon, by the way, time to the minute to coincide with the changing of the guard. That takes place at 11 o'clock, and the St. James's contingent then march back along the mall, and they're due to take uh, up their positions for the guard uh, some four minutes before the first marathon runner is timed through Admiralty Arch. And by the way, we've got news now of the leaders at uh, 5,000 metres, just beyond three miles. Uh, the time, 14.58, we're told unofficially. Glenn Foster of Sunderland, Steve Anders St. Allens, Hugh Jones, a former winner, and Seiko of Japan are among the leaders. His Royal Highness about to depart, but he really uh, has made this an extra special gala royal occasion. Street parties going on. That's London. That's the sound of London. Jamaica Road, I think. I know there's at least another two of these street parties. There's one in on Docklands. Everyone wave your ponies. Every single one of you. Come on. Ladies and gentlemen, you may think that it's pretty bad weather down here. In fact, it's persistently raining, but we're not going to let that spoil things. If you have a look at the crowd on Jamaica Road, you'll see they're all enjoying it. From Jamaica Road to the mini-marathon start. And we've got uh, race three almost underway. And there's the departure of His Royal Highness, and there'll be a few waving from down below. Uh, Prince Charles showing an interest in the marathon as it started today. And now he's going to follow the uh, line of the race. I did draw the line between uh, Prince Charles, 1986, starting this London marathon, and Queen Victoria uh, in 1908, having the distance changed by 385 yards. In fact, uh, my apologies to historians, Queen Alexander. The yellow and whites. Race two, 14 and 15 year olds. And training three times a week, many of these. I know that the Hounslow Club have been very well organized. Certainly Harring they have, and uh, there have been bunches of kids gathering from all over the boroughs. And uh, a lot of schools represented, a lot of them already in athletic clubs, but some of them not, and maybe after this they will be. 
Ron, it seems a little easier to get the kids out running these days than it was when I was a school teacher, or probably when you were, but uh, I'm sure the London Marathon is of that effect. It's removed any stigma from people going out running, it's great to see that. Absolutely, for men and for women, and what a tremendous uh, span. You know, if, really, if we're talking about uh, sport becoming democratised, to use a corny word, well, you've got everybody in this, haven't you? The fat and the thin, those who are able-bodied, those who are less able. We've got 80-year-olds uh, and we've got 11-year-olds. We've got natural athletes and we've got those who will find this a very tough day indeed. We just had the last uh, starter going through there. Gordon uh, Dumbrell, health service worker. That looks like uh, Jerry O'Rourke has taken the lead and Chris Hallam. Remember, he led last year. Jerry O'Rourke from Dublin, a civil servant. Works in the Department of Education. Cuddy Sark is a sight that he'll know well. Not much between them at the moment. And they've got one win each against one another, Chris Hallam and Jerry O'Rourke. So this is the big showdown for them. Some of the youngsters in the uh, the green, these are the 11, 12 and 13 year olds. And these look as though they're moving well. Some good athletes here. A number one, would you believe? Number one from 351. Number one. Gerald. O'Sullivan from Haringey wears one. Well done, Jerry. 351 is closing that gap. And they are 351, Paul Barnett. Oh, uh, sorry. Paul Ryan from Barnett. He's a 12 year old. And they look as though they're swinging along nicely. There's a lot of evidence there that these youngsters have trained for this. They look uh, very accomplished athletes, and that's a, that's a race that's uh, looking very promising indeed. The work has already started on cleaning up the uh, coverings the various athletes have used at the start, and that really has been a problem. Uh, they won't mind when they're running in this sort of weather, in these conditions, but it has been a problem really finding shelter. In the two to three hours, a lot of the athletes have had to wait for the start. I think this is where the local rotaries and round tables will come into their own because this will be cleared. All the working groups that have been involved in this, the athletic clubs that have been involved, the sports council, the marshals, they will clear up this and they will man the feeding stations and the sponging stations, all part of the massive organisation that makes the London Marathon not only possible but makes it uh, the, great, uh, the great celebration here in the city. Number 10, coming up to Cuddy Sark. That's Joe Fletcher, who was second in the 1983. Joe Fletcher from Harringay. They're doing well at the moment. 17, Mark Agar. And uh, on the left there, 46. And that is Mark Weatherall, a five-hour man, hoping to do better. to the leaders in the mini marathon 13 is the leader in the mini marathon this is the youngest age group and that's uh, Keith Cullen from Hounslow I said Hounslow were well organized this 13 year old is doing well tiring just a little bit this is a three mile run from Tower Bridge to Westminster Bridge and that's a big lead Keith Cullen of Hounslow has got away We'll try and pick up uh, this youngster who's uh, spot his number. He's coming in, wearing gloves, trying to stay warm. Keith Cullen away, and he must sense that uh, just about 10 yards behind him, he's got, uh, he's got a race on his hands. But he's going to be first home, there's no question about that.
15.50, there you are, for three miles. 3.58 is home as well. Three five eight, Danny O'Donovan from uh, of Barnet, and three five zero, Martin Snowden also of Barnet. So Barnet have done well in that opening race of the mini marathon, the eleven, twelve, and thirteen-year-olds. One more group ready to go. Remember, this is a team race. Race three, off at ten, the seventeen-year-olds or the under seventeen, and of course the. Uh, the Amateur Athletic Association will not allow anybody under the age of 18 to run a marathon. This is why this race was organised for the younger age groups. Those running, uh, it will be the uh, boys running in orange, the uh, ladies, the young ladies in navy blue. And again, all 33 of the London boroughs involved in this. Well, I'm in front of the third and last group of mini marathon runners and I've got uh, two attractive young ladies here with me. And a lot of lads as well. Now then, my love, where do you come from? Um, Hanwell, Ealing. What, what's your name? Julie Dowling. You're used to running more than are you? Sometimes. I mean, three miles presents no problem to you, does it? No. Would you really, I mean, if you got itchy feet, would you have loved to have had a go at the 26 miles? Yeah. Do you think one day you'd like to do that? Yeah. And uh, you're I'm also from Hounslow. Your name? Sounds like Fanning, yeah. Have you been in training for this event? Yeah, quite a bit, yeah. Do you look on it as a, a race or do you look on it as just a bit of fun? Both, really. Take it both. You are taking yeah. it very seriously? Yeah. Are you getting to this moment? But yeah. There's yeah, about sure. uh, two minutes, I think, to go. Yeah. Let me have a word uh, here with uh, one of that. Can I say to Chelsea? Yeah. Where are you from? Wandsworth. Water? Yeah. You are? You like football Where's as well as you're running? Yeah, a lot. What is your specialist event in athletics? I think it's probably the 100 metre sprint, but I do like having a go at this. Oh, right, but you're, you're really a power man. Yeah. Uh, well, we're edging forward now, so I'm going to have to let you go. Good right. luck to Thanks all of you. Cheers, Bob. I want to know what a Wandsworth lad is doing running for Kensington and Chelsea. But there they are. Harrow, Hounslow, very good club and uh, look well organised. Barnet have run well. The Marshals doing a super job there, holding these enthusiastic runners back. But these under 17 year olds know what they're doing, and there'll be some, uh, there'll be some All England schools champions amongst this lot. All of them train for this. Look at this steadying influence, bringing discipline to bear, and this is the time, of course, they have to learn the discipline of the event. Weather seems to be getting a little better. The soft rain, but it seems to be lifting just a little. Each of these will get a souvenir medal, get the VIP treatment, get the big wrapper. Just edging forward to the start line for their 10 o'clock start. And they'll be home around 10.35, this lot. Splendid piece of organisation. Hold, 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 hold. <laughs> it's all right, but they're being pushed from the back and they're away. The third mini marathon underway. Three miles, and they too have gone steaming off. It really is a bit quick. Sanity will return after about half a mile, I should think. But that too is a lovely sight. The girls in their navy blue, boys in orange. Meanwhile, at Cutty Sark, the leaders are approaching the uh, six and a quarter mile point. This is around 10,000 metres, and this is the news. Leading group includes Steve Anders of St. Helens, Seiko of Japan, two previous winners, Hugh Jones and Mike Grattan. 
Anton of Spain and Stig Husby of Norway. Those are certainly among the leaders. Uh, the five-mile time, by the way, um, quite quick. It was 24.10, which means they're knocking out 450 miles. And if that's to be believed, Brendan, and I've got a six-mile time now at 29.02, so it looks fairly consistent. They're on uh, target for something around 2.7. Seiko's there. Steve Anders is the tall figure. A Hugh Jones in the blue vest. And number nine is Husby. Number 23 up there, Anton of Spain. And the other Japanese, Kanhai, is with the leaders, number five. Christoph Herder of West Germany in the black kit going through. And they're already beginning to get away. Steve Anders, number 81. He's run just over 63 for a half marathon. Followed by number one, who's Seiko, winner of six marathons, four in Japan and two in America. Kanhai in third place, wearing number five. And just behind him, Hugh Jones. Also there is Hughesby and Christoph Erler. So those are the top six. And they're already beginning to stretch them out. And Brendan, that uh, pace news, if it's to be believed, and it looks to be right, is pretty quick now. That is, that pace is almost, uh, it's, well, it's under 2.8, it's 2.7, and it's close to world record pace. And I noticed Steve Anders is doing absolutely right. He's doing a great job there. For the second group, there's Kevin Forster from Gateshead Harriers, and number 30, Henrik Alban of Denmark. So, I mean, there's a other race going on here because there are places at stake in the Commonwealth Games and the European Championships. So I think people like Kevin Foster, who I was expecting to run well, is probably weighing up who's in front of him and who's next to him and probably trying to do enough without killing himself to make one of the teams this summer. And we saw Lindsay Robertson go through, uh, Brendan, and he'll be uh, hoping for a place in the Scots team for Edinburgh. Lindsay Robertson was wearing uh, 39 from Edinburgh AC. As they go through, uh, check on the pace. The first mile, 4.51. It's remarkably even. Then 4.55, 4.43 in the third mile, which is a downhill stretch. Uh, 4.50, it's slightly downhill. Well, there's a gradient on the course. It drops from the start to the finish. So 4.51, 4.55, 4.43, 4.50, 4.51, 4.52. And that is ideal pacemaking because it's so even. Well, Steve Anders is doing a great job with that pace, and I think uh, he's a, he, this is his marathon debut. He's run some very, very good half marathons, and as long as he doesn't get crazy in the next five or six miles, then I think he should be considering about uh, how fast he's going to finish and not worry too much about that initial pace, because there's only about three or four people going with him, and uh, it's all about trying to qualify for the games for Steve Anders. Race medley just went through shot there. Tremendous background, 5,000 metres, 10,000 metres, and now marathon runner. And the mini marathon will be on its way. And these... Uh, here's the mini. Ian Runson. 5.64 is looking prominent. 5.64, oh, and there's a 6.87 in trouble. 5.64. There's a little toddler there going through. And uh, that's uh, Alison Angel. Wearing 564, we saw her go through and coming up really hard. Look, overtaking the uh, tail enders of the youngsters, wearing 951. He is looking very good. Lewis Jackson, the 15 year old from Enfield. Here he goes, Lewis Jackson from Enfield. The athletes now, and these are good club athletes. Uh, going through uh, past Cutty Sock. They come along the main road, and there's a little diversion here around Cutty Sock, the famous tea clipper, before they rejoin the main road and go on their way to Surrey Docks. <laughs> Got seven miles time now. Uh, Greta Weitz has just gone through, by the way, the leading uh, athlete in the women's race. And uh, the seven mile time for the men, 33.54, another 4.52 mile. 
plenty of room to uh, let the wheelchair athletes race alongside these athletes. Uh, they start separately, of course, because they could cause a bottleneck, but they're uh, out of their way and uh, weaving in and out without causing any obstruction. And they're not looking too distressed, these youngsters, as they come up to the finish. Westminster Bridge, the same finish as the marathon runners, and you can see the yellow shirts getting involved. Middle of the pack. Nine twenty six just went through there, one of the Bromley runners. Three seven oh finding it a bit tough to see Matthew Brown go through. That's uh, Barry Town of Greenwich, age twelve, and uh, dying for the finish. Just hoping it's going to come up very soon. He can see it now. He'll be home at Barry Town. Good finish from this. Looking very strong indeed. Of course, the computers whirring away to sort out who's winning this team race. I've got a regional interest in a, an athletic club, uh, Ron. I was up in Wolverhampton yesterday for a, a men's road relay, but the youngsters up there are uh, very, very jealous of these youngsters from the London borough. And um, perhaps sooner or later we'll see a nationwide mini marathon. Yes, I think there's a, a lot of feeling that that should happen. And this, of course, is one of the great recruiting areas. I mean that in the best sense. It's youngsters attracted from schools, by the Borough Recreation Department, training on, uh, on local tracks, and all the clubs are there. And this is where they can start their athletic career. And I'm sure it's true of Gateshead, Brent. Well, that's right, Ron. Last summer, there was a race, a kids' race in Gateshead, finished at the stadium, which was it's their equivalent of running the London Marathon. And uh, there were 3,000 kids running. So this is the fact that we've brought it to national attention by being seen on TV. They'll be queuing up tomorrow. The, the kids are in Scotland and all over the place wanting to get in their version of the London Marathon. And so they should if they want to. Yeah, I think it's been said, you know, questions have been asked, why can't the youngsters run in, in a marathon? And yet the medical evidence suggests that uh, youngsters under 16 or so shouldn't run more than 10 kilometres. Now, that doesn't mean to say that they're going to hurt themselves necessarily if they do, but the strongest medical advice is that uh, uh, for all sorts of reasons they should be attracted to races of less length and is less distressing. And, of course, these uh, bones and joints are still growing, so they shouldn't be attracted to actual marathon distances, but there's nothing wrong with uh, training sessions of up to 10 kilometres. And, indeed, we're finding that that distance and the half marathon distance is gradually becoming more attractive than even the marathon distance because it still is a, a bit of an Everest and the number of people are being attracted to major races is for the lower distance, the more manageable ones where training can be uh, reduced maybe to four days a week rather than every day. Can those ki kids go home, run and tell their parents that they've run the London Marathon? Though? Sure they can. They ran in the London Marathon and that's good enough. The athletes at Cutty Sark now, and the real bunch is going through. This just beyond six miles. And, of course, they merged after three and a half miles. We've got uh, some more information now on the leaders, and very little has changed, except that we've now got uh, Pat Peterson of the United States on the leaderboard. The information we've got, actually, is that... Uh, Steve Anderson, uh, Steve Anders rather, Seiko and Kanhai, uh, the top three there, are some ten yards clear, just beyond seven miles from Hugh Jones, who's then uh, ten yards ahead of Christoph Hurler of West Germany, Peterson, United States, and Hughesby of Norway. Check there on the pace. Some of the fun runners going through. And a lot of vets amongst them, a lot of over 40s. We've got an eight miles time now for the leaders. 38-39, a 4.45 mile between seven and eight. Well, that kind of pace, 4.45 per mile, takes them 
almost on world record pace, possibly even under world record pace. And I think the conditions are fine to run that kind of pace. I think Seiko is a good enough marathon runner to keep that going for an awful long way. So I think overall that pace is contributing enormously to what we hope is going to be another record-breaking London Marathon. We've seen the numbers this year setting new records. This is the biggest number they've ever had starting, and I would think they'll easily exceed the greatest number of finishes they've had. So overall, uh, with that kind of pace, great contribution from Steve Anders setting that pace, um, London looks like it's going to break another record run. Indeed, and the minus that we're seeing under the times, Brendan, I understand, means that they're faster than the time of last year, faster than the course record time. So every time you see a minus, it means they are running faster. And looking at the masses here, I'm going to have to do some apologising tomorrow when I go back home to, to the runners at home because we didn't see the race itself, but I'll, I'll apologise now. It's technical problems. It's not our fault. We'd love to see the leaders as well as to see all the carnivals and the band at Jamaica Road and so on. And that pancake flipper that just went through, I think he's got his own personal record. He's going to toss a pancake the whole of the 26 miles, 385 yards. And they're going to be cheered on all the way. Fans everywhere, despite the rain. This is at Cutty Sark. Back, back to Jamaica Road. The Burley Kings and Queens are there. And nothing will slow them down, I assure you. What's these two? I met this hula. And they'll be greeting the leaders fairly soon. She used to play ukulele under coconut tree. And when I said. Oh, a lovely. This is what we want. Steel band. At the at the Tower Hotel keeping themselves protected and we saw we saw a Rastafarian earlier uh, up with the lead group so he'll be delighted at this the Thames looking beautifully calm I think the rain is slowing down a little bit and Frank you're being urged to come on When you look at that shot of athletes approaching the six and a quarter mile mark at Cuddy Sark, you realise what a mammoth job of organisation this is. I should think the girls in the marathon office, led by Sue Richardson, are sitting back and relaxing a little bit and breathing a sigh of relief. Over 25,000 were accepted for this, over 80,000 applied, uh, but Chris Brasher tells us that was a calculated risk to take more than 25,000, because experience shows that through uh, illness, injury and in some cases sheer inertia there's quite a considerable drop dropout and they were hoping that not more than 20,000 started because they couldn't handle them at the finish we've no actual news of how many did start but certainly it's a world record figure it was 19,800 that had registered late last night and they didn't expect uh, many more dropping out so they may not have made the magic 20,000 but it's still certainly a world record the biggest marathon ever and the point that I'm dreading, Brent, is there's a number of friends tomorrow that are going to say, there I was in the middle of the screen, you didn't recognise me. I've never recognised anybody, in the, and I know plenty of them. They say, I was on, and you, you know me, and you saw me, and I say, well, I'm terribly sorry. But when I look at these masses of runners, Ron, there's one, one issue that really concerns me. I, Toshi, Toshiko Seiko from Japan is the fastest marathon runner in town today. And yeah, the, we'll get the leader back. in the junior race coming in there sprint finish number 1624 Christopher Stanford from Canterbury great run that was actually I think it was Nigel uh, Flint uh, uh, it was a Harrow boy he's only 17 um, just with that tremendous sprint finish just managed to take it so good tough races going on in the mini marathon 1624 and 1625 together from the mini as the youngsters go through we've got news of Greta Weitz who's leading the women's race uh, eight mile time 41 13. sorry if it irritates uh, some of the viewers who've been with us uh, from the start but I must explain that uh, because of flying restrictions, we're not able to follow the leaders on our uh, mobile cameras, the motorcycles, and also the helicopter. The cloud ceiling is too low for our television cameras uh, to fly with a helicopter. We're hoping the weather will change. The forecast is that it will change by 11 to 11.30, hopefully, and we'll be able to get airborne then. That means we can only follow the leaders on our fixed cameras. And the fixed cameras, the next point we can pick them up, uh, Jamaica Road, which is approaching Tower Bridge and the 12-mile uh, mark, just beyond the 12-mile mark.
Well, it's great to see the kids crossing the line with that spirit. I mean, we've seen some decent runners amongst these kids. Um, hopefully, we'll see some of them step up to the marathon. But I was making the point earlier that the second fastest marathon runner in town, a uh, young South African boy, Mark Platches, who I spent some time talking to yesterday, and whilst he's sitting in his hotel watching this race, my heart goes out to him because he's, he's run two hours, eight minutes, and 58 seconds. He's, fr he's from South Africa. He's a coloured South African, and there are 40 white South Africans running in this race today. And he explained to me, he said, look, the, colored, the white South Africans have ancestry in, in Europe, in Britain, in Holland, and so in Switzerland, and so on. And they can come and get passes to run in these kind of races. I'm a coloured South African, and I, I have no ancestry. I'm a South African. I'm an African. I want to run in this race. I'm the best runner in South Africa. He said, I've travelled here with these, kids, with these other people. And he said, and I can't run. Run. That's politics yeah. trapping someone who's done no harm. They're called passports of convenience. The South Africans that are running in this race are running under passports of convenience. There's the Gurkhas, and we're delighted to see them. It is a truly international affair. Brendan's absolutely right. There are anomalies that exist, and uh, if only we could uh, salvage and get rid of the passports of convenience, perhaps the South African problem in sport would be solved. Some fascinating figures actually emerging uh, from this marathon. As you look at these runners going through, uh, by profession, there are over 2,600 engineers, there are 11 politicians, there are about 40 stockbrokers, there's 67 taxi drivers, uh, there's nearly 800 policemen, uh, and a word about the policemen, by the way, they make this possible, the uh, city and uh, metropolitan policemen, um, because their services are free and the barrier work they do is invaluable in organising this. There are about 60-odd farmers in it, 170 doctors, more than 600 accountants, and, uh, well, there are nearly 500 housewives as well. And I understand, David, that not one of those policemen that, uh, that marshals this course charges overtime on the day of the London Marathon, and, uh, and that is absolutely marvellous. What about the St John's Amherst Brigade, too? They're out here en masse, 600 or so of them, and uh, they'll be mopping up and rubbing down, and uh, when, we get to the, uh, when we get to the cramp and the uh, tired and aching limbs, they'll be on there just urging these on. A lot of the fun runners still up with this lot. I saw... Uh, one man goes through it with a heart scanner appeal. There's every one of the major charities involved in this. And the muscular dystrophy group, the Marathon group, where the captain is Harry Carpenter, I think they've got over a 1,000 runners running for that one charity alone. That's Marathon, and they wear red vests, and uh, really a tremendous job. And just at a gathering of the British Sports Association for the Disabled last night, they were giving out some T-shirts and a cake to celebrate their 25th anniversary and we quickly sold slices of the cake and raised £100 in no time at all. It really was a lovely, lovely gathering.
expedition mini marathon well wrapped up against the uh, cold but of course these are not bad conditions i must stress that for marathon running it may be a problem to the people who are out on the roads for about five hours they may get uh, chilled but uh, for the quicker guys it, and girls it's going to be fairly good running um, we've got news of the leaders, by the way. The leading group, Seiko Japan, Anders St. Helens, Kanhai Japan, Hugh Jones of Great Britain, a former winner, Stahl of Sweden, uh, Peterson of America, Hughesby of Norway. So that's the leading group, plus Christoph Hurler of West Germany. And news of the uh, wheelchair wonders, Jerry O'Rourke from Chris Hallam. Jerry O'Rourke from Dublin. A civil servant in the Department of Education was second to Chris Hallam. He got edged out. And that's not Chris behind him. I think that's, uh, that looks like Mike Bishop. He's wearing seven. Certainly wearing three is Jerry O'Rourke. Jerry O'Rourke, a double amputee. And it looks as though Chris Hallam has been edged out of second place. And I think it's Michael Bishop from Church Tower in Gloucester. And Hallam is in third place. I think it's Mike Bishop. And they're dreading the cobblestones. That's the scene in Jamaica Road, which is approaching Tower Bridge. Tower Bridge is... Uh, just beyond 12 miles and they come off the Surrey docks at this stage uh, then come up Jamaica Road and turn right over Tower Bridge and the crowd waiting there for the arrival of the leaders the latest uh, time news we've got and they're knocking out uh, 450 miles fairly consistently well 48 13 for 10 miles brings them brings them close to world record pace 207 30 run about that kind of time and the conditions, as I said earlier, the conditions are fine to do that. And the runner, Seiko from Japan, is good enough to do that. So, uh, you know, the London Marathon is, again, living up to its great reputation in overall um, quality standard. Each morning at dawning, bird is singing, and everything is sun. Kiss, miss, and don't be late. That's why I can hardly wait. The athletes must be very close now to the uh, band in Jamaica Road. We've had an 11 miles time, uh, which was 53 minutes, 10 seconds. The last mile, 4.57, as they came through off Surrey docks. Uh, the road service, by the way, much better than it has been through the docks in previous years. It's improving with every year's running of the race. Incidentally, Greta Weitz's time has been corrected. Uh, our time was impossibly fast at eight miles. We are getting all these times remote, but it does look as if the men's race is being timed or the information we're getting is correct certainly the women's race has been a bit slower than we've been reflecting i think but uh, the men's race they still we believe on schedule for one of the fastest marathons ever run i think uh, toshihika seko has got something to prove because uh, he's undoubtedly one of the world's greatest marathon runners but the last time he was in england uh, he uh, he struggled badly at milton Keynes about uh, about eight years ago well, i'm not quite sure we'll pick up the athletes here but uh, it looked like a couple of the uh, police outriders going through there. We might just get a glimpse of the leaders. You can spot them. Um, you are as remote at home as we are. The numbers are one, Seiko of Japan. 81 is Steve Anders of uh, St. Helens. Number five is Kanhai, Japan. Number four is Hugh Jones, Great Britain. Number eight is Stahl of Sweden. Number six is Peterson, United States. Uh, Christoph Hurler is number three from West Germany. 
the road. And of course, we should get right good coverage when they go on about half a mile up the road to right. Tower Bridge. Dancing in the street lane There's now. the lead uh, timing car. So it rather looks from that as if our uh, timings, which have been flashed back from along the route, our mile timings in the men's okay, race anyway, Tokyo. have been pretty accurate. And there is Steve Anders in the uh, red banded vest from St. Helens alongside him. That looks like number one Seiko. There are two Japanese up there, but I think that's Seiko, the faster of the two Japanese, and it is. He's the fastest man in the race this year. He's won, I was just checking back actually, he's won five uh, marathons in uh, Japan and he's won once in, I think it was Boston. Uh, but in fact, when he's run in Europe before, he's not done outstandingly well. But they're flying along very, very nicely indeed. It was said that Steve Anders would be in there to set uh, some sort of fast pace for the athletes. But Steve Anders is a dangerous athlete in his own right. He's had some very, very good half marathon form and no one can take liberties with him. There's Hugh Jones in third place going through. He's a previous winner. Uh, Mike Grattan was with the leaders, another previous winner, but he has been dropped. Enjoy at last for these spectators, because they've been waiting, whoa, a couple of hours for the first of the athletes to appear. Seco, the inscrutable Seco, who really is one of the iron men of marathon running. And uh, there'll be some familiar faces in Christoph Hurler, certainly in this bunch. So all the big men appear to be up there. Hurler's on the far side there. Uh, Number 69, also with them, is Huen uh, of uh, Norway. And Pat Peterson's with them, and Pat Peterson's a man who's a big threat. That's the American, the 26-year-old. He's a six-footer. He wears number six, Pat Peterson, one of the big threats. News of Greta Weitz, we've had a corrected time now, and it looks more sensible. Uh, Greta Weitz, we're told, went through 10 miles in 54-24, her personal best is around 2.25. She's only ever been beaten in one marathon, by the way, the, that she's finished. That was the Olympic marathon when she was second uh, to Joan Benoit. Uh, Mike Grattan going through. Uh, former winner, as Hugh Jones is. Uh, but uh, they're quite a bit off the pace now. Christiansen of Denmark was one of those in that pack, wearing 18. Sven-Erik Christiansen. And there's Sheila Ekstahl, one of the most consistent marathon runners in the world. He runs about 20 marathons a year, and he's uh, absolutely, every time there's a marathon, he's there and he's running in it. Actually, Chris Brasher was telling me, Brendan, that uh, Stahl had to guarantee if he was running in the London, he wouldn't run a marathon in the previous month. Well, that's quite difficult for him because he loves the marathon. He runs about, he ran about 30 odd marathons two years ago, and everyone who, I mean, but he still runs well. I mean, it doesn't seem to harm him. It would harm most normal runners. I don't think anyone's ever run as many marathons as he has. That's right, but he was asked to slow it down for the London. That was Philip Mills, 27, in the wheelchair, incidentally. The athletes going through now, the chasing groups, the Jamaica Road. Meanwhile, the leaders are approaching Tower Bridge. Just beyond 12 miles. Check on the times we've got. Way inside uh, five minute miles. Uh, 4.50 brings them back in just over two hours, seven minutes. And they're still on schedule for that. Uh, Hugh, uh, Steve Jones's course record is 2.8.16 set last year. And they are inside that time at the moment. Steve Anders still alongside Seiko of Japan. Seiko, his best time is 2.8.38. Uh, Four times the winner of Fukuoka. He won the 98.3 Tokyo Marathon, but also first in Boston. Seen him on the track over here. We, he also ran in Milton Keynes when he was way back in the 60s some years ago. As I said before, his European form has not been good. He's keeping a careful check on the pace, and they're both looking very relaxed. Hugh Jones in third place at the moment. Hugh, who was the 1982 winner, two hours, nine minutes, 24 seconds. He's way inside that pace. And he looks, uh, Brendan, as if he's finding it hard. He does, but I think he's come out of that second group because the second group was further than behind than that, so... Uh... Hugh Jones is making a rush here because I think Anders is, is here as a pacemaker. Seiko arrived, he asked for a pacemaker on about 2.8, 
He's got a pacemaker which is taking him around 2740 or 2730 even. So he's got what he wanted. And I think Steve Anders will be thinking about, do I keep going? Do I try and win the race or do I just keep going as a pacemaker? And I think Hugh Jones in second place. This is a psychological halfway point, and I think Hugh Jones is going to start thinking about his overall result now. Well, Hugh ploughing on, and uh, he's got in his sights, of course, a place in the, uh, the European Championships in Stuttgart. He said that's his declared intention. Steve Jones already picked for that. And there's Alistair Hutton, the leading Scotsman, wearing number two. He was third last year, and he's not very pleased with the uh, Scottish Commonwealth Games selectors. Uh, uh, Alistair thinks he should have been selected as of right, and a lot of people agree with him. One of the Turks what? behind, sorry, that's Tertzi, of, uh, and one of two very good Turks in this race, Tertzi running just behind Alastair Hutton there. But there's Alastair Hutton leading that group, and I agree with, with Alastair's opinion. I think Alastair should have been selected for the Commonwealth Games. Uh, I think Scotland needs athletes of his calibre and of his quality, because I think he could have had a chance in that event. So uh, he's running well again. We often see Alastair running well. Whenever he comes to England, he certainly gives of his best. And he looks pretty good there. Just behind him is Tetsi the Turk. Just behind him, Kavernmo of Norway. Uh, Pat Peterson is there as well in the headband. Christoph Hurler just at the back of that pack. And 10, here's Kevin Forster from England, the Gateshead athlete. Mike Grattan in the centre of that pack there. 116 is Phil O'Brien, the old Gaytonian, on the left of that pack. Number 11 is Sedelio Cato of Portugal. There's another uh, Turkish athlete there. And uh, 74, that is Ahmet Altun. Failed to finish in the uh, Los Angeles Marathon, but has had a good time since then. 41. We we'll just check on. You and Ellis from Cardiff, Newport Harrier. Best of two hours 15. He reckons he's going to do two hours 14. He's just about on schedule for that. David Long is 239. Member of the Massey Ferguson Runners Club in Coventry. And he's way inside his best time, which is 225. Better fights coming through at Jamaica Road. She's now approaching uh, 12 miles. Interestingly, David, she hasn't got her elder brother running with her as a pacemaker. He injured himself earlier in the week. She's got a younger brother, but he's nowhere near as fast as Greta. But there's always a group of athletes that run with her. And I think some of the Gateshead boys might be out there, Brendan. And there she is. Got a phalanx of runners to protect her and keep her going along. A lot of good club men out to help Greta Weitz of Norway. And didn't she look uh, very comfortable there? We've no news, by the way, of the British runners down the field, but of course it's very, very difficult indeed to track the women's race because uh, they get so mixed up with the uh, good male club runners. Uh, Veronique uh, Morrow is the number one Briton and she is the fastest Briton ever. And Veronique Morrow, we're looking to uh, improve on our own British record. She's in that kind of form. She ran 70 minutes for a half marathon a couple of weeks ago, so she's looking to significantly improve on our 228 British record just leading that group there of men is Ray Smedley and a former winner just with him Inge Simonson but we uh, we can't actually relate these and how far behind the leading group there which is a, a little bit of a problem but but Greta in that group I think is running under her personal best time but I don't think she enjoys entirely having been totally surrounded by men I think she's much happier running with her brother she's running around the world with him and he's pretty good you know so uh, Often when he's not there, or this time when he's not there, she's been taken up by about 20 others, which is a bit of a problem. Got some pretty startling news from the halfway stage, if it is, uh, or just approaching the halfway stage. Uh, this is supposed to be the official time, and I've no reason to doubt it. 62 minutes, 54 seconds. Well, that halfway time of 62 minutes, 54 seconds, uh, it's, a, it's a bit quick, David. I agree, I've just uh, got a corrected time. That was 13 miles, actually. It's 63.30, but that's still quick. In fact, they're on target for two hours, seven minutes. If they can run the second half as fast, which one would doubt, but having said that, uh, they may well do with the pressure. And not a bad day for the leaders in a marathon at all. Uh, the weather's cool, uh, the wind in the main has been behind what there is, and there's one of the uh, 
Paula Fudge and Anne Ford, I think together there, the twin sisters, pretty well. They look to be well up. I didn't see Veronique Marrow go through. On paper, she ought to be ahead of them. But um, another of the girls going through, just hidden slightly. One six two going through. The youngster in the mini marathon, uh, finishing there and enjoying himself, running backwards. But actually, 63.30 at the halfway stage, Brendan, um, they're really pressing it. That's right. I mean, 63.30 brings them home in world record time. And, and, and you said that, uh, you know, whether they could run the second half just as fast. And then a few, two years ago, I would have said there's no way because people don't run the second half fast. But these days, since the great runners have stepped up in the marathon and the pressure has increased on the marathon, then people can come home faster than they go out in the marathon. So... Uh, this record of uh, Carlos Lopez with Seiko pressing it has got to be under threat. This London course has uh, produced some great times. Last year's record of uh, Steve Jones, 2.8. I mean, so, uh, you know, let's, let's not dismiss it yet. It is quick, but it's, it's been consistent. It hasn't got, they haven't gone out and slowed down. So I think there's an interesting next half of the race to look forward to. Max Colby on the left. And we saw young Jeremy J from Barking and Dagnan, the 15-year-old, that ran backwards for his uh, mini-marathon. I thought Max Colby was going to run with Greta. I don't suppose he'll be far away. It was anticipated that they might run together. Max, of course, a very experienced runner. But uh, we're looking for Greta in the middle of this pack. And there's some well-known marathon runners uh, in this group, some steady old runners. There's Greta. Running one. Soon to retire possibly after Stuttgart at the end of this year, really brought marathon running into the consciousness of the public as far as women were concerned. Raised the sights enormously. Began life as a high jumper, would you believe? She was first recognised as an athlete by Terje Pedersen, the world's first 300-foot javelin thrower, and suggested that uh, she took up athletics. She began as a high jumper, then started running, and uh, there she met her coach, who's now her husband, and he will be in the lead car, carefully monitoring everything that she does. Husband Jack. Greta Weitz then, still setting the standards. A couple of uh, useful uh, club athletes with her. Uh, we think this may be the second girl. And it's Mary O'Connor, if that's right, of New Zealand. A regular competitor in the London Marathon. She's been here before and a very good athlete too. Uh, Mary O'Connor, just to give you one or two details. She's 31. She's got a personal best of 2.28.20, which is fast. She was second in the uh, London Marathon in 1983 and fifth last year. Uh, Greta's got uh, one or two useful club runners. There's Peter Probin of the military services, Aldershot, a member of the Army 3As, and Roland uh, Gibbard of Charmwood Athletic Club, 164 and 234. They're two uh, 20, low 220 marathon runners, and that's uh, Greta's target. Just trying to uh, track the uh, ladies' race. We've got the first two through, we believe, but of course, uh, being remote, it is difficult to uh, know whether someone's gone through a hidden. So far as we know, Greta Weitz is well in front. O'Connor of New Zealand in second place. And judging by the Jamaica road shots, F10, Paula Fudge, and F5, Anne Ford, could well be third and fourth. I've got a third... Uh, Girl going through actually, Kirsty and it's Jacob. F9. Kirsty Jakobsen from Denmark, the 30 year old, fifth in the 84 marathon. And Ford and Paula Fudge together. That's a close race indeed, isn't it? Because there are three girls there really battling it out for third place. But actually, David, there's one missing, and that's Veronique Marrow, the one we were looking to uh, set a new British record. doesn't say she's not there, because we're having real difficulty in uh, isolating them when they're run surrounded by men. But uh, the, the Paula Fudge and Anne Ford, the leading Britons, and doing extremely well. And this is the kind of running that one expects from these two, and I think they'll even get better at the marathon. They've been good track runners, they've been good cross-country runners, and now they're settling down and enjoying the marathon, and both of them are capable of revising that British record, which... Uh, 
is, has been moved on recently. That's uh, Jakobsen from Denmark wearing F9. We believe uh, those are the uh, leaders in the women's marathon. Uh, but of course, there is the question mark about Veronique Mara. Those are the mild times. And uh, Greta, the leader, is still very much on uh, course for a personal best, although she may not threaten Ingrid Christensen's world best and the uh, London Marathon record last year of 2.21.06. Well, uh, there's a young man called Nigel Flynn, who we saw sprint past the finish in one of the mini marathon races, and we can hear now from him at Westminster Bridge. Nigel Flint, well done indeed to win that senior boys race. How did you find it? Um, it was hard all the way. It was good opposition, um, particularly last mile. I was really struggling to hold on, but I did it. So. What about the crowd? Did it help you? Yeah, it was. It was very good, particularly around the finish. You know, everyone starts to get tired, and it's really good having them cheering you on, yeah. Where are you from? I'm um, Harrow, Pinner. Really and, and your school? No, uh, Harrow Wheel, Sixth Form College. Ambitions in track and field? Uh, too early to tell. I'd like to make it, you know, to the top, but just got to wait and see. It's really too early. What's your event on the track? Um, 1,500 and 3,000 metres mainly. Today, a big boost in your career? Yeah, yeah. I, the time was miles quicker than I expected, although I was hoping to win it, obviously. So, yeah, I'm very pleased with it. What about next year? The, the full marathon next year? You're old enough, aren't you? Yeah, no chance. I couldn't do a 26-mile road race. A lot harder. How are they going to find it then in the last three or four miles of the main marathon then? They're going to find it tough, are they? Is there a wind? Very tough. Yeah, there is a wind. It's against us most of the way, really. Um, but they're coming in that way, so they should be all right, really. It'll be on their side. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Good day for him to remember. Well, we've seen the leaders through... Uh, well, they're beyond the 14 miles mark now. And uh, the main pack going over Tower Bridge just beyond 12 miles. But to way back at Cutty Sark... Uh, this is the uh, six and a quarter mile mark, or approximately, and still they go through. These are the fun runners. And the fancy dress uh, competitors. Meanwhile, ahead, bigger stream passing an impromptu street party at Jamaica Road. And uh, they'll be pleased to see Tarbridge about uh, half a mile further on. <laughs> You're nearly there, I wish he thought so. <laughs> I hope he sees that sign. We've seen Mahatma Gandhi go through, and we've seen Superman go through, and we've seen one or two walkers who walk this distance uh, uh, very well indeed, and will be ahead of some of the runners at the finish too. Incidentally, some good news. We do hear, by the way, the weather is clearing rapidly and our helicopter should be flying. In fact, I believe it may well be flying at this moment. Will, will make all the difference to our coverage. And in fact, the uh, helicopter is in the air now and we've got our first shots. Now, this makes a big difference from our coverage point of view. I have explained before, again, forgive me if it's irritating those who've been watching all the time, uh, the situation has been that the uh, helicopter, the BBC helicopter, could not fly. Uh, because of the cloud ceiling was so low. It's got to fly at a thousand feet. And uh, from there, it reflects pictures from that tracking camera we've got on the uh, alongside the lead runner, who is Seiko, by the way, of Japan, who's now broken away from Steve Ambers. And we're getting two helicopters up there, one to get pictures from the uh, lead motorcycles there, the tracking shot alongside the leader, and of course the other one can then cover the race in general. That's what uh, we've been missing for so uh, much of the race so far, but as you can see from the quality of the shots, the weather is changing rapidly. And the red brick road tells you we're in the London Enterprise Zone, in the Docklands. A brand new road, and industry growing up all around it. Seco, a discipline of Zen training, who uh, lost his coach last year, one of the great coaches of marathon, the father of marathon running in Japan, Kiyoshi Nakamura, who died in a fishing accident, but was the man that transformed this fairly modest athlete who went to an American university and thought he was going to do things and began to, his athletic career began to get away from him. And then the coach, Nakamura, went out there and said, come back, 
accept the discipline of training and you could be one of the world's greatest marathon runners and this is exactly what he did and he really is recognized as one of the great disciplined men of running he once ran 57 miles non-stop in a training run to assure himself that uh, that the training was going well and he's broken away from a world-class field here by a considerable marching and he was uh, perhaps always the favorite brendan but uh, certainly he's looking uh, a transformed athlete is he not he was very disappointing in uh, the Los Angeles Olympics. Most of the athletes were nervous about him because he'd had a string of victories and he hadn't been beaten for about five years, I think. Um, and I was talking to Charlie Spedding yesterday and I said, if you were running today, who would you be worried about? And he just said, straight away, Seiko. And he didn't mention another name. So, I mean, th this athlete has, you know, he's got something about him. Um, but he's, this isn't his normal style. He normally waits and waits and waits and there's no one good enough for him to wait on. I mean, I've seen him run and sit on, on athletes and kick with 60 meters to go in a marathon. So for him to press out and lead, it's an unusual style. So uh, let's see what he's like on his own. We've never seen him like this before. Indeed, Brendan. He, he is recognized as having a kick, which is rare in marathon runners, as Brendan was saying, but he really can sprint at the end of it. He trains himself to do that. 17 miles now. Jerry O'Rourke is there, and I think that's Mike Bishop with him. If we can see the number, if he's wearing seven, it's Mike Bishop that's taken the lead, and Mike Bishop is the fastest Englishman in the race. And these two guys locked together. They've dropped Chris Hallam of Wales. Jerry O'Rourke from Dublin. Mike Bishop from Church Toe in Gloucester. Two hours, 25.31, he's ahead of that uh, schedule now. And these two guys together, taking it in turns. Look at this, slipstreaming. Back to blue suede shoes. Here's our man in third place, Chris Hallam, winner last year after a great battle with Jerry O'Rourke. He uh, won after a battle over Westminster Bridge. He's struggling at the moment and he's uh, in trouble. 23, this lad, a sufferer, a paraplegic from Gwent. And uh, 
He's a good all-round athlete and swimmer with six British records to his credit. And he held the world record as a breaststroke swimmer for some considerable time. And he was, I talked to him last night and he was looking forward to this battle. And it looks as though the, uh, the machinery may have let him down. Or it may be his own strapping. These are the athletes um, at Tarbridge approaching halfway. And we've news of Greta Weitz's time at uh, halfway. 72.04. So she's inside a personal best time at the moment. Incidentally, we've had a, a flash from along the course about Veronique Marrow, the fastest Briton ever in the ladies' race. We were a bit puzzled we couldn't see her. Apparently, there's a report that she had stomach trouble last night, and we don't know whether she started. X. X57 is the oldest competitor in the race, and that's uh, Pat Riley, who assures us he's 82. As for occupation, he reckons he's retired, except for marathon running, and he really is uh, some character to talk to. Very sprightly former sprinter, and he's going to tot around here and have a chat on the way. And uh, if I'm feeling or looking that good at 82, I should be delighted. Pat Riley from Woolwich. So Pat Riley will know these streets well as he dodges around the Cuddy Sark. Estimates he'll be back in five hours. Oh, Archie. Just about to join in. Not the beef eater, this one. Actually, the record number of finishers in a, a marathon. 15,881, last year's New York race. Uh, London, by the way, well, the record number of finishes uh, was clocked last year, 15,841 from 17,500 starters. But, of course, it should be higher than that today. I think this is Terje Roll. If he's wearing four, it's the Norwegian. Very good Norwegian who uh, has competed in marathons before, has a best time of two hours 14. That's what makes me think that it's uh, number four. Yes, it is. That's Roel of Norway. Should be able to join the leaders, by the way, on the uh, helicopter shot and also the tracking shot of the motorbike very shortly. And we still understand Steve uh, Anders is in the race, although he's his pacemaker, but Seiko is leading. Steve Anders on our last splash was in second place, and we're told Hugh Jones is third. There's the lead car, approaching the 17-mile mark. Island Gardens on the Isle of Dock. And it's Seiko, the favourite from Japan. It's 29. Very, very experienced uh, marathon runner. He says, running is my only girlfriend. <laughs> World record uh, holder on the track at uh, 25 and 30 kilometres. And a recent race over 30 kilometres uh, suggested that he's in spanking form. He just missed that world record by three seconds, so there's no doubt about it that Seco reckons he's ready for this. 
And this event, of course, the marathon fits the Japanese mentality perfectly. Bit of a samurai warrior on the course there, I think. Some news from the front of the race is that uh, we understand that uh, Steve Anders, who was uh, chasing and helping Seiko in many ways um, over the first half of the race, uh, has now dropped out, and Hugh Jones has moved into second place, but there's no confirmation of that yet. I think I just saw John Holt go through picture, the secretary of the International Amateur Athletic Federation, self performed international half-miler. I'm pretty certain that was John Holt that just shot through. Carla Ali, our oldest woman. Very experienced. This is the lady that trains at 4 o'clock in the morning. She says it's less crowded at that time. She'll be helped on her way as well. Another great spirited character. Carla Ali. This is uh, Yutaka Kanai, Japan, the 26 year old, much taller than Seka. He's 5 feet 10, this fellow. Seventh in the Olympic Games, 10,000 meters. And both these uh, Japanese uh, marathon runners are excellent track runners at 10,000 metres and 5,000 metres. So that shot suggests that he's in third place, so it's Japan 1 and 3, with Hugh Jones of Great Britain in second place. Seiko leads, and Hugh Jones, we believe, in second place. Kanhai is third, and I think at the back of the shot there, on the Isle of Dogs, I saw Alistair Hutton, who was third last year, and there he is, number two, going quite well, alongside the Turk, who's Tertzi. Tertzi at 2.12, man, just inside 2.13, 2.12.54. 16th in the Olympic marathon, and he's running uh, a very quick race today. Yes, I think Tertzi was a winner of the Frankfurt marathon, and uh, and that's the uh, that's the sort of form that he's in. And Alastair Hutton running with a good man. Kevin Foster there. The leader stood out on the Isle of Dogs. Comes off uh, that little loop and then uh, turns back towards uh, the tower. Goes uh, through St. Catherine's Dock, Wapping High Street, St. Catherine's Dock, then past Traders Gate and the Tower of London, and then along the embankment, the Mall, and the finish at the top of Birch Cage Walk over Westminster Bridge. It's very, very wet out there, by the way, but Seiko looking very, very strong. A lot of water lying on the road in the Isle of Dogs. I was around the course the other day, and there was certainly a lot of puddles, but it's not going to bother these uh, top runners too much. And incidentally, the other athletes, I saw a name out there I'd never spotted on the London Marathon course before, and he's just approaching it now. I think we're on the wrong side of the road, actually, to see it, but that's unimportant. It's a lovely name for the poor people down the field. Sufferance Wharf, and that's after 18 miles. Just an indication of this man's form when he won the 1983 Fukuoka Marathon, which is uh, one of the great marathons in the world. He ran that in 2.08.38, the third fastest time in history at that time. But in that field, he beat Salazar, Ikanga, Chiapinski, and the So Twins, and that's why he's the most feared man in the field today. Well, Ronnie's only lost one marathon, that was the Olympics, since 1979. So, I mean... I was explaining earlier that the boys have a sort of reverence for him because he was expected to do very, very well in the Olympic Games. But looking back to second place, we saw a shot a little bit earlier of Hugh Jones. Seiko looks really good, and the world record is certainly still within his grasp if he can continue this pace and increase it. But I don't think the race is over because the race is... Uh, he's still got to go through the 22 miles and the 20-mile mark, and I think... Uh, we've never seen him extend himself to this extent. We've never seen him on his own for so long. and. Just out of sight, just round that corner, Hugh Jones must be, because uh, I didn't think he was that far back. Maybe my comments were slightly premature. In fact, it's very difficult to judge distance on the, these tracking shots, but uh, our information was, and it was flashback from the course, was that uh, Seiko was 100 metres in front of Hugh Jones. But certainly at this stage, uh, judging by that shot and knowing that uh, stretch of the road fairly well, he looks to be further behind than that. And I've got to say, this part of the course looks downhill, the, uh, the sort of speed that Terje Roel is uh, drumming up on his wheelchair alongside him. That's the only company he's got. 
And uh, he's, uh, as Brendan was saying, his stoicism will be tested here. He rarely runs uh, way out in front. But he does come uh, from this, uh, this school, this dis discipline of Zen training. That was what his coach Nakamura was famous for. There are about 90 athletes, most of them Japanese. Uh, that, uh, and Hugh Jones has been out there to visit that school. And they really do discipline themselves tremendously. It's not just Zen, it's a mixture of Buddhism, Christianity and Zen. Uh, but it just tells these fellas that uh, running is not only physical, it is mental as well. And it is a great mental test, the marathon. And we're just looking to see if uh, Hugh Jones had come into shot. He hadn't there, so I think he's more than 100 metres behind. Hugh Jones. Hugh Jones, who won this race in 1982. And indeed, the British uh, have dominated it since the uh, first London Marathon in 1981. That was a tie between Dick Beardsley, United States, and uh, Siemensen. Then Hugh Jones here won the uh, second running. Uh, Mike Grattan won in 83, Charlie Spedding in 84, and of course Steve Jones set the record last year, two hours, eight minutes, 16 seconds. Hugh's working very, very hard indeed. And he'll be well pleased with this run because the aim for him is a place in the European Championships team, of which Steve Jones has already been selected. Incidentally, if you're a bit puzzled and you've just joined us about the wheelchairs, uh, they started some 15 minutes before the main race. Hugh Jones there, wearing his Ranelagh vest. Liverpool based for some time, where he was at Liverpool University studying architecture. Then he went to Budapest to do town planning. He's now settled down in Kentish Town, or Camden Town. He's moving in there with his wife. And he's a great character as well, Brendan Hugh. This lad who used to do walkabouts for about six months on end and go into the desert and uh, go to Kathmandu. Uh, and then it found that it was affecting his running and he did find at uh, the London Marathon that here he had the potential to be a world-class marathon runner and has come back and has rather changed his attitude and is now a much more disciplined athlete than he was. Well, except that he's just come back from China, Ron. He, uh, his coach, Alan Storey, who's a coach of Mike McLeod and the distant marathon coach in Britain, who's done a remarkable job out there in China with those uh, athletes, because obviously he's got a lot to choose from. But Hugh went out and trained under him. He ran a marathon out there in 2.10, which is his first marathon since the Olympics, and he'd run well there. So he's come here with some good form behind him. They were expecting him to do well. Just uh, fascinating experiments uh, uh, we're conducting here uh, by remote control, trying to see how far Hugh Jones is behind the leader. That's the helicopter shot that we've missed so much this morning, but thank goodness the cloud ceiling has lifted, and it's quite a long way. Actually, a good shot there, because you don't realise how this course twists and turns through the docks. Uh, runners on the outward journey, there are some two to three miles at least behind the leader. The Red Brick Road in the Isle of Dogs. And uh, they'll just get a shot of Seiko. And that is some gap. It looked to be 300 metres or more. And uh, no sign of flagging at the moment. I think the question is really, can he survive? Because I didn't think, we didn't think here that uh, he was quite that far ahead. So now it's up to him. The race is between him and the road and the distance and his own measure of fitness and his own mind because he's, he's uh, far enough clear to win the race, but he's running at a much faster pace than he's ever run before. He's running close to uh, as fast as anyone's ever run before. The course record, his own, ja well, not his own Japanese record, but the Japanese record is in sight. And the world record's got to be in sight if he can continue to to run on his own and apply himself as some of your suggestions earlier run about his mental discipline have uh, suggested he might well as david's already suggested he said the marathon is my lover and he follows the samurai code of it's hide your honey hide your real intentions but be constantly on the alert and look for the instant your enemy's guard is down well he's got no enemy in sight at the moment but he's hiding any pain that he might have and he really is looking a formidable uh, runner on this course Toshihima Seko really running away at the moment, 29 years of age, five foot six from Yokohachi City, and really is looking quite superb. Just slowed very slightly to just over five minutes. I think that's the first mile. He's run outside five minutes between 17 and 18, 501. Uh, but of course, that's the difficult period of the race now, uh, when uh, you're still very much aware of the pace you've been running at, but more importantly, how far you've got to go. Hugh Jones in second place, coached by Alan Storey. 
This is 16th marathon. His first was run back in 78 when he won the Duchy of Cornwall race in 2 hours, 25 minutes, 13 seconds. Uh, but, of course, he's improved an awful lot since then. And he also won the three A's at rugby in 1981. He was first in Oslo, also in 81. And he won the London Marathon in 82. He was first in Stockholm a year later. He's had these injury problems. And Brendan, uh, he's not the most graceful runner, is he? But he's very strong. He is very strong. If you just looked at his face, you'd say he was struggling. But I remember when he won the London Marathon, he came down the mile and he was absolutely flying. But he still looked, uh, just looking at his face, that he was, uh, he was struggling. So I say he's running strong. Uh, he came out of the pack, he's chased, he followed his own pace, he didn't go with that early pace set by Anders, and he's, I think he's running well, and I think he's going to, uh, this is going to be one of his fastest times ever, if not his own fastest time ever, and really, you know, if he just stays there in second place, he's done enough, because he's here to qualify for the European Championships, and all right, Seiko's here, and he looks as though um, he's going to win this race. There we see Seiko again, but uh, Jones has run really well, and it's great to see him back because uh, with Spedding already selected and, Hugh and Steve Jones already selected, he's our next best, if not as good as, marathon runner. There's the leading woman, Greta Waite. She's running around 2.24 pace, which is her personal best. And if you think of her career, she's had a remarkable career at the marathon. And, it, you know, here she is almost at the end of that career and running personal best times. And I think she's been spurred on for her personal best today by what's likely to happen in Boston tomorrow because her country mate and great rival Ingrid Christensen is running in Boston tomorrow and they say she's going to run under 220. That's the race for women. It's like the four-minute mile for men. And Greta knows that. She knows that Ingrid is in great shape. So uh, Greta's going to come today and uh, not going away, go away without making some headlines. Greta White's, of course, one of the highest-paid women athletes in the world, £100,000 a year. She and Mary Decker and Zola Bad, three of the highest uh, paid women athletes. Changing the guard at Buckingham Palace. And so exact is this timing, by the way. I think this may well be the St. James's Palace contingent on their way to take up the guard positions. And uh, it's time to a matter of minutes, actually, to coincide uh, or to miss the arrival. I mean, the worst thing that could happen is uh, for the athletes to arrive through Admiralty Arch as the uh, guard is marching back along the mall. But it's uh, very, very tightly timed. And we're told there'll be a four-minute gap between the St. James's Palace contingent uh, taking up their positions, having marched along the mall, and the lead runner coming through Admiralty Arch. And that runner looks certain to be Seiko, although the news is that he's slowing slightly. 17 to 18 miles, he was over five minutes for the first time, 5.01, and then 18 to 19 miles at 5.04. But at the moment, he's still on schedule for a new course record and one of the fastest times in history, because if he can keep going now in the closing stages, he can still break two hours, eight minutes. Those are some interesting signs, though, because when you start slipping over uh, five minutes after you've been running 4.50, um, it's not because you choose to, it's because your body makes you. And uh, I was asking the question about seeing him exposed on his own at the front and see him apply himself on his own because he prefers to run in a group. So uh, that, those are interesting questions. And when we look back to Hugh Jones, he's running strongly, he's running well. So that we've got a race on here. It's not just a one-man race. Some fascinating news, though, now of a change in pace at the top. Um, Chris Brasher, who's in that lead timing car, the race director, uh, we're through to him on a, a radio link, and uh, Chris has just been telling Stan Greenboard, our statistician, that uh, the uh, lead car apparently was giving Seiko some trouble. He was uh, having to slow between 17 and 19 miles, but in fact they've sorted that out, and uh, he's now speeded up again from 19 to 20 miles. He ran 4.47, which is quite uh, an astounding mile time at that stage. And they're looking at the times. He's a minute ahead of uh, Steve Jones's as record. He's a, he's a minute ahead of Steve Jones's record, which was 2.8 last year. So uh, he is still on world record pace. But, you know, the 5.01 mile, we've got to ask the question. If the reason was that he had the, the car in the way, then fine. But, I mean, I, I still think we've got something of a race. It's not just a one-man thing. Yeah, you raised the question, Brendan, and the question marks must occur at this time. And, of course, the reason, one of the reasons he ran badly in Los Angeles was that he had hepatitis, and that's a very debilitating uh, 
uh, disease to suffer from and it takes months to clear. Having said that, Hugh Jones, of course, had uh, injuries in 82 and he was operated on by Viren's doctor then on his, uh, on his leg. And uh, so they've all suffered because this is a brutal training schedule. 120 miles a week, these two fellas do. They've upped it from the 100. Uh, and so the sort of... Uh, battering that their knees and ankles just as acting as shock absorbers for 20 30,000 strides is bound to have a wear and tear effect and it always does but to suffer a, a debilitating disease like hepatitis also had its effect on this iron man seco These athletes of the tower, and shortly, by the way, Seiko will be going underneath the tower and through uh, past Traitor's Gate, some six to seven miles ahead of that group. I don't know how they got up there, but that's a fabulous view. <laughs> that's uh, the view at the finish. There's a Good shot there. Uh, it may puzzle some non-athletes that uh, those finishing funnels, uh, Brendan Foster's an expert on these. Uh, in fact, they're so beautifully organised. They're they ch channelled in there, aren't they, Brendan? And that's how their positions are counted. And they're very, very accurate. They have to be, but that's almost become a science on its own. And uh, Paul Canson, who's a, one of the best finish directors in the world, um, organises this finish and in the Great North Run that we organise up in the northeast of England where we have 25,000 runners, John Trainer does the same thing. They compare notes every year to see how the thing works. But Paul Canson quoted in the official programme saying, running the finish is harder than running the race. <laughs> I think he's right actually. But the pressure's not on yet. They're just having a relax and they're probably interested in the race, interested in who's leading and interested in how long they're going to come, how long they're going to take to be here. We saw there the number of uh, entrants that were accepted for the London Marathon and then we saw the number of finishers in the London Marathon. This year we think there are around 19,000 who actually started and I'm sure that prediction of around 17,000 is going to be accurate because I'm sure they're going to set a record this, this time. And we're looking at Seiko, the weather's improving as he's going through here, his pace is increasing so we may be seeing two sets of records. Seiko in the area of uh, Wapping High Street and approaching picturesque scene in St. Catherine's Dock. Chris Hallam there, I think was in third place in the wheelchair race. Ron Pickens has been following that. He had a few problems. I think actually he was back to fourth, but he appears to be back in the race now, and that's good news. Chris Hallam wearing one in the wheelchair race. Now, see if we can get some indication of whether that gap has closed, whether Hugh Jones has managed to erode down what was something like uh, 300 metres that Seco had on him. Going past, I think that's Gun Wharf, is it? Just past there. Faithfully following the time equipment and the uh, tracking camera we've got down there.
Actually, it's rather puzzling to us uh, what's happening behind him there. It looks as like if there's another runner there, but it surely can't be. Oh, it's one of the wheelchairs. Yes, it's Chris Haller. It's behind him. But these cobblestones, the cobblestones that were a problem uh, as they go through the tower, well, they've been covered as well. They've been working all night to get some impacted earth down so that uh, it's not too tough on them. But there's a few cobblestones here they've got to get through. Look at the massive redevelopment and regeneration that's going on in London's Docklands. It really is quite remarkable. New buildings, and John Disney said how much he's had to change the course as new roads have been created and new buildings have uh, been put up. They've had to divert, but uh, my word, they go to some uh, immense degree to make sure that it's absolutely accurate and that this marathon shall be a couple of metres over uh, the 26 miles, 385 yards, so that all these good performances can be put forward and recognised as world best times if they should be there. Seiko now approaching St Catherine's Dock. Uh, there are cobbles here. And by the way, uh, John Disley was saying that uh, they wouldn't be able to lay the special carpet for the leading runners over the cobbles in the Tower of London if it was raining. So um, it's been pretty heavy rain in the early stages of this morning. So they may well have had to leave those cobbles. Now, you may remember last year, this was where the lead changed hands slightly with Charlie Spedding getting away from Steve Jones. But then Steve came back along the embankment to win the race. This is uh, around 22 miles. That's the scene. St. Catherine's Dock. And they go over a very picturesque Dutch bridge. And that's the first of the uh, docks to be uh, rebuilt and regenerated. It really is a beautiful scene. It's got an ambience all of its own. And following that will be the East India Docks, the West India Docks, and uh, the railways are going in, the, uh, the store port is going in. This is St. Catherine Dock, the first of the London Docks to be rebuilt. Crossing private roads here, incidentally, permission has to be granted. There's the Dutch Bridge. the Tower Hotel. And it's a very positive run by the Japanese. He came here as the favourite. And he's run like a winner right from the start. He really taken the race by the scruff of the neck. Once Steve Anders dropped out, uh, Seiko has really dominated. The interesting thing about these cobblestones is that they're slippery rather than hard on the feet. They really are quite slippery. And uh, it, although it creates a pleasant walkway in the rain, it's fairly treacherous. And you can see it's just a little bumpy through there. There's a marvellous view of the tower. The lonely figure of the leader. And meanwhile, overhead, Hundreds and hundreds still streaming over the bridge, over Tower Bridge, some seven to eight miles behind. There we see Seiko. He's, I think he's feeling some effect now. He's glancing over his shoulder. He didn't need to because there's no one in sight. But uh, he's never been in this position in the race. He's really spent his career running in very competitive races in Boston and Fukuoka and elsewhere and he's never found himself having a lead for this far so he's, he's in new, new ground for himself. I think he's concentrating on the finish, how far he's got to go to the finish and uh, I think he's slowing there, he doesn't look as fresh and he's certainly his concentration, that was the first lapse of concentration we've seen from him when he looked over his shoulder and there's Hugh Jones in second place and he's not that far behind, I don't think he's as far behind now as he was at some point in the race. He looks a workhorse, doesn't he, Hugh? He really is grinding it out and gritting his teeth. Tough guy. But Seco, of course, has been moulded by a thousand years of ideology and philosophy. 
and the Japanese have a passion for this. And Chris Hallam back in that wheelchair race, and he's uh, you saw where he was in relation to Seko, and now he's dropped back a bit, and Hugh Jones is about to overtake Chris Hallam. Hugh Jones. Alistair Hutton there, uh, together with Kanhai of Japan, and also it looks like Tetsai, number 73 of Turkey. And this is the race for third place. And they won't want this to happen for too long, because uh, the last thing a marathon runner wants at the, end, at the end of a hard race like this is a real sprint finish. Uh, Alistair Hutton is going to present the selectors with a problem. Hugh Jones looks as if he's on the way to a second place and a place in the European Championships. As we were saying earlier, Alistair Hutton is a little bit peeved, and probably rightly so, that he's not been selected as of right by the uh, Scottish Commonwealth Games selectors. Uh, Charlie Spedding has for the uh, Commonwealth Games for England. Uh, Steve Jones has for the European Championship. Uh, but uh, Alistair Hutton has said, I believe, that if uh, the choice is his, he'll go for 10,000 metres in the Commonwealth Games and concentrate on the marathon in the European Championships, which would be a blow, let's face it, to Scotland. It would be a miss to Scotland up in Edinburgh, the Commonwealth Games this year, and I think Alistair would be in with a real chance of doing well in that event. But I think it's a wise choice for, from his point of view, because to run the 10,000 in the Commonwealth Games would be a good build-up for the European Marathon. Uh, I think Alistair's good enough to really dictate to the Scottish selectors what he, sh what he wants to do. Unfortunately, they're not giving him, giving him that choice, and uh, so we may see him in the 10,000 metres. And I don't think these days he's as good at 10,000 metres as, as he is at the marathon. Still Hutton, Tertsai and Kanhai together. And as they go through, we may be able to pick up the race for the places in the first ten. So there's three, four and five. And the sixth man should be in sight. Japan with two men in the first five. An interesting history which dates back to the 36 Olympic Games and Kitty Song won it, and uh, Kitty Song turned out to be a Korean, but it did uh, give the, uh, the Japanese an event to identify with. Kevin Forster there, wearing 10, but I think there's a small group in front of them. But Kevin Forster running well. And the leader now, clear of the Tower of London and approaching the embankment. Seiko of Japan, the 22 miles time, 147.40, and he's slowed quite dramatically then with a 5 minutes 16 second mile. He looks to be going quite powerfully, but in fact he is slowing. And those are the uh, various mile splits uh, for the leader. And incidentally, he's uh, some 92 seconds, we're told, ahead of Hugh Jones in second place, who went through 22 miles in 149.12. There we can see a strain on his face. That's the first kind of pressure we've seen from Seiko. And we sensed through the tower area that he was slowing, but there's the evidence that he's not only slowing, but he's finding this really hard and he's struggling. And he's out there for a, a, a personal best time. He's out there for a Japanese record. And these, these landmarks are slipping out of sight. 2815 is the Japanese record. He's desperate to prove himself as being the number one Japanese runner. He's signalling with his with his hand there. I'm sure he's asking for a drink. He's waved four or five times, and I'm sure he's not the type to celebrate his victory. I'm sensing that he wants he wants some help. So Hugh Jones, about a minute and a half behind. That's possibly the closest he's been in the last few miles. But uh, Hugh, looking just the same as he's looked for the last five or six or even ten miles. That grimace is a grimace of. Uh, it's not as bad as it looks, actually. I think Hugh always looks like that, frankly. Actually, he'd probably look a lot better if he could see the sort of problem Seiko's having up front. Absolutely. He wants one long road where he can see the back of the Japanese. And, uh, and this really is a serious business for the Japanese. Uh, cast your minds back to 1964, when Subaraya 
was uh, second in the Tokyo arena in that marathon, was overtaken by Basil Heatley of Coventry, and because he was overtaken, he never recovered, and he committed a ritual harikari suicide as a result of that. They really, this is a very, very important event. He really shows strain, and this man is now showing agony. It's not just strain, he is really under the cosh, and he's got problems. Seco in real trouble, it looked as though the cobblestones uh, had a dramatic effect. And if Hugh Jones can get one look at the back of that man on one long straight and realize that he is suffering badly, and certainly if he could see that face, it would, uh, it would give Hugh a lift to know that this race is not yet over. It just shows you, though, in the marathon, it's not how you look and how you feel at 10 miles and 15 miles that matters. It's how you feel from 20 miles to the finish that matters. And we've seen him struggling here in the last couple of miles. This race certainly isn't over, even though that's an enormous gap, because once you've gone, you've, you've gone and you go, and you can see he's, the, the pressure on his face. We can see that his legs aren't as bouncy as they were before. Mine, nobody's legs are as bouncy as they were earlier in the race, but... Uh, this is interesting, it's exciting. This is his chance to establish himself as the number one in Japan, so this time still really means an awful lot to him. The course record, there's incentives for the course record, and you can see the course record, he's slipping away from it. He's seven seconds ahead of last year's huge, uh, Steve Jones time, and in, in previous miles, he's been minutes ahead, so... Uh, interesting too, Brendan, that uh, the most recent test he's had as to his own racing ability was over 30 kilometers and not over the 42 kilometers of a marathon distance and he's into that area now and hugh jones might just be sensing it and he's swinging along he's still got a lot of drive in his arms and a lot of uh, knee lift in his legs he's grimacing okay because it's hurting out there but conditions have improved and if he gets that lovely long shot of seco then, although there is an enormous gap, it's one which is still manageable. This is the gap that we're trying to see. Hugh Jones looking for the back of Toshihiko Seko. It's a long, long way, but that's the time he can see it. And this could still turn into a race. Hugh driving hard, uh, but uh, he too looks very tired. And it's not surprising because the early pace was very, very fast. But they're both suffering. And of course, this is a, a very testing mental part of the race because coming along uh, the embankment there, in the far distance, you can actually see Big Ben, which of course is just uh, before the finish, but there's a loop to uh, run round, which takes them on a, a longer route to complete the 26 miles, 385 yards. So mentally, it's a very testing period because they're turning away very shortly from the finish. I agree with that, though, because that's, that really is psychologically tough because you see the finish there. You can see if he looks to his left, you can see the finish, but he's actually got to turn right, and go away from the finish, and then swing right round. And amazingly, two or three of the people who've won this race have commented about how difficult that is, how mentally difficult it is, because there you can see the Houses of Parliament down ahead and uh, and the finish is, is to the left there. So um, Seiko's still got quite a few miles to run, and Jones, is, as we've seen now, is, is suffering a little, but behind Jones there's an interesting race going on, Alistair Hutton, and there's also an interesting race for places in the English Commonwealth Games team. One wonders how their race plan has gone. Seco clearly went out for a very fast time, and that may be partially uh, affecting uh, the way that he's running now, although he's still full of running. And Hugh Jones may have paced himself on the sort of uh, pace he is at the moment, and it may not quite have affected him, although, of course, both are looking very tired and worn, as well they should, because the discipline and the sheer distance of this race is, uh, is very tough indeed. You couldn't have a better picture there than the illustration of the pain of marathon running. At the very top level, it hurts. And I've always felt, Brendan, at the very top level too, these boys have only got so many fast ones. I would support that entirely. 
it seems to be there's a career which lasts maybe four, five, or six marathons. Once they've once they've lost it, they very rarely recapture it. Alberto Salazar is a good example of that. He held the world's best time for quite a while, and once it's gone, it's gone. And it seems to me that you know a career should be planned a long time in advance in terms of how many marathons a year you're going to run. And uh, if they run too many, which some of the Americans have been doing recently, then their performances suffer drastically. But this is his first race since the Olympic Games, where he was so disappointed with that 14th place, where everyone in Japan was expecting him to win. A lot of observers worldwide were expecting him to feature. Um, Carlos Lopez won it, John Tracy was second, and our own Charlie Spedding was third. And all three of them were asking, as soon as they crossed the line, where's Seiko? Because he had this little bit of mystique about him. And I think it was fairly clear from that shot that Chris Hallam was the leader in the wheelchair race. Uh, Gary O'Rourke, I beg his pardon, in the green of uh, Dublin. Interesting background on this man, because uh, eight years ago he went to the University of Southern California, having failed to get into Tokyo University, and he put on a lot of run, uh, a lot of weight, and was running pretty badly. Uh, when he met with the coach Nakamura, who suggested that he was letting down Japan and letting down their image of distance running. And it was then that he returned to Japan and went to Tokyo University and accepted the discipline that this event demands. A tremendous hero in Japan, of course. Seko, as are all their uh, good ja uh, marathon runners, the So Twins. And the man uh, in fifth place, can I? Sago uh, just uh, turning out of Northumberland Avenue, um, and he's got within his sights now the famous Admiralty Arch. He's the leader in the men's race. And meanwhile, uh, back at the tower, we should be able to see Greta Weitz shortly, who's the leading lady. So Seiko faces up to the wide open spaces of the mile. He's got uh, just over a mile to go. And although he must be feeling very tired indeed, and clearly is, he can hardly feel threatened. It's noticeable, in fact, he hasn't been looking back at all. So he must have some information about how the race is going. But he's not, uh, although he's been in pain, he's not seemed very anxious about where Hugh Jones is. So he must be getting race information. He may well be, because he only looked round once, and I thought that was the beginning of this, just passed through the 40-kilometre mark, two hours, two minutes. So he's uh, got 2.1 kilometres to go. And he's got, he's still on for that good, rec good record time, though. It depends what happens here in the last, the last two kilometres. But he's fairly well clear of Steve Jones, and I think of Hugh Jones, and he looked around, he didn't see anybody. That probably gave him a mental boost. The only person he can see, and he's looking there now, the only thing he can see is a, a wheel, the leading wheelchair athlete. I would suggest he's not very bothered now about the second athlete. He's, uh, he's more bothered, rather, he's not uh, very bothered about the time anymore. He's more bothered about the second athlete. And uh, a measure of his tiredness was the way he wandered across the road, actually, when he looked back. Anybody who's ever run any distance at all will know that feeling well because you can't hold a straight line. The, the legs have been pounding, the rhythm goes as you look back, and he's got now, what, a mile, just under a mile and a quarter. We may be able to look back along the mile to our Admiralty Arch and see if Hugh Jones is closing. And he is in sight now, and there's no doubt in this closing uh, couple of miles, Hugh Jones has been closing the gap all the time but it uh, looks too great for him to actually catch the Japanese Seiko now with Buckingham Palace in sight and really that uh, has been a dramatic change Hugh Jones is fairly storming along now he can see Seiko he's trying to attack but uh, I must reckon on that shot he must be some uh, what still 80 to 100 meters behind 
but really when an athlete is tiring in the way Seiko is it's amazing how much you can close in the last mile and Hugh Jones now has the encouragement of seeing that the leader is tiring and knowing actually that he's feeling strong himself and this is the first sight I would say he's had of Seiko uh, since they since they took off since they started the point being here it's about Seiko slowing down definitely we don't know how much it is that Hugh Jones is picking up and, and speeding up but uh, Seiko is suffering badly and he's slowing badly and I mean there, there we can see it and there's the sight this is the point in the race that all the athletes in Britain certainly dream about coming along the mile leading the London Marathon and there, there he's turning that corner there at the top of the mile and if he knows the course and knowing these guys they'll have been looking around it he'll have measured it um, he knows how far he's got to go I think that, that lens we had on the ground was a bit deceptive. I think the, uh, the helicopter shot that, uh, showed that it was nearer 200 yards than 100 yards. That's the gap, and although he's closing, that's uh, still a tremendous gap that he's got to close uh, on. And, uh, and he still looks as though he's got some bounce in his legs. He must sense that Hugh Jones uh, is behind, although he hasn't really spotted him, and Hugh still looks dogged and determined. He's trying to lift himself. Uh, he knows he's clear in second, he knows he's running for a fast time and he'll get selection in that but whether he's uh, got enough time left or enough energy to close that considerable gap on Seco is I think at this stage doubtful. Seco looks at the watch and that will be telling him the story of how he's fading in fact because his last mile was 5.20 uh, odd so he's slowing down but we believe he's safe. Seiko, uh, I don't think can see Big Ben there. He's very, very anxious now, though. Well, he's, he's gone from a 2-7 pace, and I think he's slowed so much in the last two or three miles that he's going to be lucky to... He's not going to do 2-8, he's going to do 2-9 now. And, I mean, when you see he's gone from world record pace and it's all gone in the last couple of miles, it tells you all about this event, and it tells you about... How to pace yourself early on it tells you about being in a position that you've never been in before because Hugh Jones has been on around a 2-9 pace for most of the way whereas Seiko's slowed dramatically and here's the result you can now see him and that leading wheelchair athlete has done remarkably well to clock this kind of time run. Jerry O'Rourke two hours 12 his best time the 22 year old from Dublin and uh, and that's the sort of time he wanted because he had such a battle with Chris Hallam he knew he had to get away from him and he's, uh, he's in second place overall at the moment, but, but of course he's got time to be added on. But Jerry O'Rourke uh, in between the two uh, who are battling it out, and Hugh Jones still pounding along. He really uh, uses a lot of energy to cover the ground that he does. He's got a big arm swing and a big knee lift. And Alastair Hutton appears to be, if that's the, uh, appears to be in uh, third place and has run remarkably well. Getting away from the Turk now, Alastair Hutton of Edinburgh making a big point here in the London Marathon. And it may well be that Seiko now in these uh, final few yards is getting away again. Hugh Jones has clearly settled for second place. What a marvellous moment this must be. Britons have won the London Marathon for the last four years. Dick Beardsley, United States, and Inga Siemensen of Norway, dead heated for first place in the initial running of this great race. Then it was won by Hugh Jones in 82, Mike Grattan in 83, Charlie Spedding in 84, and in 85, we've got the first Japanese winner. Outside two hours nine minutes, but winning now more important than the time. Toshi Iko Seiko, the man who started as favourite and has finished as champion. It's 29. Chris Gracia. The race director jogging in ahead. First, for a winner of the London Marathon, 
And Seiko, though tired as he approaches Westminster Bridge, is still quite strong. Being directed to the right finishing funnel. And Seiko wins for Japan the 1986 London Marathon. A really powerful piece of running. Positive. He's had to work hard since he took over in front because for the last, what, 10, 11 miles, he's been by himself. In a moment, Hugh Jones, the 1982 winner, will be coming in in second place. Hugh Jones chasing the man who may well be the winner of the uh, wheelchair race, Jerry O'Rourke. And they're having quite a little battle, and Hugh's picking himself up again. He dropped back, he was really struggling. He checked to see that his second place was uh, not in any danger. And look at this for a finish. It's a spirited finish from Hugh Jones. He really is pouring it on now. And he'll, uh, he's got his battle with Jerry O'Rourke. And uh, his place certain for the uh, European Championships. And good to see him back and based in this country and running so well. It was a big gap at the end of the day. Seco will be there to greet him, I'm sure, but Hugh Jones so running quite magnificently. And this has proved to be a really hard race because Hugh is going to be some uh, two minutes behind his winning time in 1982. Raw coming in to win the wheelchair race. Uh, but I think actually, Brendan Foster, this is the penalty for the very fast early pace. I think it has to be because I'm sure Seiko, if he'd been a bit more conservative early on, could have run faster than he did at 2.10. And I'm surprised that you could run 2.11.40 to finish second in the London Marathon this year because I'm sure everyone was thinking one would have to run faster than that. I'm sure Hugh thought he'd have to run faster than 2.11. And there I'm pleased to see Alistair Hutton in third place. He's done it right. He didn't really go to win this race. He, get, he came here to qualify for the European Championships. He came here to show the Scottish selectors a point because they're going to pick their team for the Commonwealth Games tomorrow. And if they pick him for the marathon, he'll say, no, thank you very much. You're going to have to pick me for the 10,000, otherwise I'm not available. And it's not arrogance. It's just that I think he knows more about marathon running than those Scottish selectors do. Well, that's anticipating perhaps that uh, Alistair Hutton will not change his mind. Uh, but this is a fine piece of running, and he finishes in third place, as he did 12 months ago. And he looks the best of the finishers, doesn't he? He looks as though he's paced himself with another marathon in mind this year. And that is an important point, because if he's running in the British best for, uh, for us in the European Championships, he saved a little bit today, and he could be a threat in that race. Alastair Hutton running superbly. Can I of Japan, the next Japanese home? And if uh, he finishes in fourth, two Japanese in the first four runners, and that's but that's uh, that's a jump to uh, Pat Peterson of America that's got through, and maybe he's ahead of uh, the Japanese as well. That's Pat Peterson who was came here with a tremendous reputation. Tertsi of uh, Turkey finishing there. A bit difficult to tell, actually, whether that was a cutaway shot we saw earlier of Kanhai, or whether Kanhai, in fact, finished in fourth place. Now wearing seven, we've got Michael Bishop, the fastest Englishman, and he's going to be second to Jerry O'Rourke, who wins two to one over Chris Hallam. Delighted to see that Chris Hallam's still on the course, but Mike Bishop is the first Englishman home in the wheelchair race, and here's Kanhai. That settles where he's finishing there. Two thirteen forty-two for Kenai in Japan, and he looks uh, he looks pretty exhausted at the finish of that. He really is. He's run himself out, no doubt about it. Alastair Hutton was the man who uh, finished looking uh, the best of the uh, first half dozen. Kaverno of Norway coming in. And there's Bishop, the man wearing 69, was Gia Caverno. We're not absolutely certain of his position, but he's amongst these. I think that's Kevin Foster. Is that on a Gateshead rest? No. 
it's the other Turk that's finishing. I do him an injustice. That's Alban of Denmark. That's uh, Kavanmo of Norway. And 11 is Caetano of Portugal. Let us run from him. And they really are battling it out now. 39, Lindsay Robertson, the Scot that we saw earlier. He may well have got himself selection for Scotland in that run. Lindsay uh, Robertson wearing 39. Kevin Forster finishing. The Gates head man. Just looking at some of these boys finishing, like uh, Kevin Foster, your club mate, uh, Brandon. Uh, we've had some pretty quick runs in the London Marathon in recent years. Uh, but uh, again, I'm convinced that uh, a lot of them have paid the penalty for the early pace. Uh, don't you think this is underlined by the way some of these boys have finished? Well, I think Kevin Foster there, 2.15, and the finish, uh, Hugh Jones finished second in 2.11. Uh, there's something there's something wrong here, I and mean, the only thing I can think of right now is that the pace has been so fast early on, some of them went with it, and they've suffered for it. Sheldrick Stahl finishing there. He always runs faster than that. And Alan Storer's uh, Chinese uh, uh, athlete, Zhu Zuchin, has gone through, number 36. He was in about uh, 15th, I think, uh, Brendan. So a good international gathering at the finish here. We've had Danes and Norwegians, Chinese, Japanese finishing with these British runners, as well as the Turks. John Boys wearing 22 from Bournemouth AC, has just got through. the second Turk, Ahmed Altoun, wearing 74, just gone through. Back in the mile, we're looking for Greta Weitz and Jim Dingwell of Scotland, City of Hull AC, 36 now, with the beard leading that little pack. Larry Cratton of Sunderland Harriers in that pack, and here's Greta Weitz. Led the women's race from start to finish, and Greta Weitz being helped along by a small pack, but uh, misses her brother, her brother, Jan Anderson, who uh, usually runs with her. 32 now, Greta, and uh, finishing very strongly indeed. Actually, she's uh, outside uh, Ingrid Christensen's course record for last year, which was 2.21.06, uh, but she's very close to her own uh, personal best on this course of 2.25.29. 189 with her, David Dixon of Sunderland Harriers. He's got a best time of 2.23, so he's very close to that. And he's the perfect companion there for Greta Weitz, pace-wise. Seems to me that Greta is suffering similarly to um, Seiko. She was on pace for her personal best of around 2.24, um, but she's got a little bit of running to do in the last two miles to, to beat that 2.24, or to get close to that 2.24. So I... I'm not sure her personal best of 2.25 is, um, is what really was her target, and I thought she was going to run 2.23, 2.24. doesn't seem as though she's going to do that, though. Interesting point, Brendan. The, the girl that's running the times back to us and telling, her, telling us uh, how she's getting on, Greta Weitz, that is, is Sarah Rowell, who was due to run in this race and one of the favourites, uh, certainly the best of the English girls, but had to pull out with injury and couldn't run, but she's running on the time clock today to let us know how Greta Weitz is getting on dashing across the park to get us the time. So Greta Weitz, and it may be one of the uh, last times we see her in a marathon, except hopefully in Stuttgart for those European championships, finishing a glittering career. And she wanted to win this one back. She and Ingrid Christensen have put Norway on the map of uh, marathon running uh, in an incredible way, and both of them heroines in their own country. Well, she's just gone through 25 miles there, and she was with David Dixon, who's a good uh, club athlete from Sunderland Harriers, the 3A champion club. 
She's put her head down now. She's pushing it because she definitely wants that personal best here. And she's still got it to do in the last in the last mile and a bit. But I, I think she could do it, but she has to really run in that last uh, batch. And she'll have known this. She'll have information. Whether Seiko got information on the way along the road, I'm not sure. But I'm sure Greta has because her coach goes on the bike and shouts at her from all over the place. So uh, her husband Jack's here to help her too. So I think they, she got the message then that she's got some running to do in the last mile. I hope some of these club athletes realise it and can help her, because, uh, my word, she's, uh, she's been responsible for a whole army of women taking up marathon running. She really has done a tremendous job. First world champion, uh, she was five times world champion at cross-country, quite apart from this career as a marathon runner. And it's extraordinary that a small country like Norway should produce another great champion in marathon running in Ingrid Christensen. And these two, great friends, but uh, often battle away. And she's a girl who's got her legs in shape after injury this year through taking up Langlau skiing, which, of course, is a national sport in Norway. She thought she was going to be out of marathon running, and she took up this long-distance skiing four to five hours a day and is a very accomplished long-distance skier. And uh, her husband and coach, Jack, said that it's got her legs in tremendous condition, and she really looks as though she's got a sprint finish in her now, and that's the reason she's running well now. That skiing has, has really paid off, helped her recover from injury, and give her the sort of uh, the spring back in her legs that she needs. But she admits that the pressures are growing. She's looking forward to retiring. She says every time she runs, so much is expected of her, but she is still tremendously popular in Norway. Greta Weitz running now against the clock for the fastest time in her life at 32 years of age. The first woman home by a long margin at the moment, providing she finishes. And if someone in that pack like Jimmy Dingwell can, uh, can realise what she wants and just pick the pace up and swing along with her, then we're going to have another remarkable run from Greta Weitz. There's a double incentive for those boys there. I can see a good friend of mine, Larry Pratt from Sunderland Harry is there. And he'll, if, as soon as he sees Greta, he'll speed up. I mean, he will help her, but he won't want her to beat him. But, I mean, I think Greta, if she can just latch onto the back of that group, she can get some incentive and some help. But you can see she's accelerating. She's finishing stronger uh, as the winner of the women's race than we did see Seiko finish as the winner of the men's race. Uh, so this is exciting. She'll be desperately disappointed to miss that personal best. And I think someone's told her that on the way. I think she can do it, and I think she's, gonna, she, uh, she's not going to slow. She's running strongly. But... Uh, there she is, passing the men in the last couple of miles. That must be tough for a good club runner, because these men are good, are good runners. Fascinating. Sorry, ben. Fascinating that, uh, although she should have a house full of cups and trophies, she's given them all away to local clubs, athletic clubs and schools. She's that popular that she gets invited all over the place. No children herself yet, but uh, plans that uh, uh, in place of Seoul. She's not going to run in the Seoul Olympic Games in 88, but she is going to run in Stuttgart, and that will be a marvellous occasion. She's so experienced, she's judged the pace of this uh, race perfectly. She didn't get carried away early on, and she's certainly finishing very comfortably. No sign of distress at all. A five times winner of the New York, or is it six? I know that she's uh, had a tremendous run in that. She's as loved on that side of the uh, Atlantic as she is here. Actually, it's even better than that run. I'm just checking back. Uh, she's won it one, two, three, four, five, six times. Mm. Uh, the, she's won there. Um, and there was one occasion, actually, she uh, didn't finish. She'd got an injury problem. But uh, you look at Greta's overall record, and... Uh, it really is uh, one of the great stories. I mean, she won the international uh, cross-country title uh, no less than uh, five times. Actually, just looking uh, back there, there's Mary O'Connor of New Zealand in the All Black in uh, second place, just going through 25 miles. We believe she's in second place. And at the last we uh, heard of the ladies' race, she was being tra chased by Anne Ford and Paula Fudge, uh, the twin sisters. One, three, six, Trevor Hall from Leicester, coming through to finish for that Trevor. Stan Greenberg assures us that Greta Weitz has won the New York Marathon seven times. I did her an injustice. But uh, her second win in the London and that'll delight her. Huh? 
She really is charging through this lot now. They must sense that she's running against the clock. Greta Weitz has gone through on the right-hand side of the shot as we look in. And now approaching the finish. Her personal best time in this London Marathon at 2 hours, 25 minutes, 29 seconds. So she's well on course for that. And Greta comes uh, home very quickly indeed. It's a personal best at the age of 32. So many times the world cross-country champion. She's now run 11 marathons, which she has completed. She's won 10 of them. The only one she lost was the Olympic marathon to Joan Benoit uh, when she finished in the silver medal position. So that, one of the quickest times ever recorded on this London marathon course by a lady athlete. She looks in tremendous shape too. Chris Brace is just going over to congratulate her. She really does uh, pace herself magnificently. No signs of distress. And uh, if ever there was a model for women running uh, long distances, it's got to be Greta Weiss. Absolutely terrific. Looking for Mary O'Connor, the second girl home. New Zealand's Mary O'Connor. She too is looking superbly controlled and well disciplined, has trained herself for this event beautifully. Mary O'Connor coming home, and she's been given a lift by these club runners, running in the black, the silver fern. And they'll be uh, very much in evidence in the Commonwealth Games at Edinburgh last week in July, first week in August. That's the next great gathering, the Edinburgh Commonwealth Games, and she'll, uh, she may even be staying on for that. Wearing that black vest very proudly indeed. Well, the New Zealand women are coming back. We saw them finish second to the English women in the World Cross Country Championships. And Mary O'Connor here leading the New Zealand uh, distance runners. I mean, they've been top marathon runners, and she, here's another one from New Zealand. I noticed that Greta has only ever, be, only ever been run faster on this course with her, her mate, her teammate, Ingrid Christensen, in setting the record last time. So um, Greta and Ingrid own this London Marathon for women just about run. Norway have got it stitched up, there's no doubt about that. Mind you, I think Chris Brasher saved some money today, has he not? Because uh, course records had to be broken for prize money and world best times, so they've saved some money. So perhaps next year's uh, London Marathon is safe. Now, that's uh, wearing uh, number five is Anne Ford for England, the 34-year-old girl from Hounslow. England's first uh, runner home, Anne Ford, the oldest of the twins by 10 minutes. She chasing Mary O'Connor, who's 31 now. Fifth in the 85 uh, London Marathon and was second in 83, so she knows this route backwards. She ran well in the Cross Country Championships this year. She was 19th in the world. And chosen for the 10 kilometer race in the Commonwealth Games, and she looks in good form for that. Mary O'Connor of New Zealand. Then Anne Ford of England who's also a former national cross-country champion and a bronze medalist in the Commonwealth Games, so she's in great form. This, and uh, that's her twin sister, Paula Fudge, wearing F10. Again, another tremendous uh, track career. The 1978 Commonwealth 3,000-metre champion, the 1982 national cross-country champion. These twin girls, it's uh, Anne Ford wearing five, her twin sister wears ten. They're almost together, and they too have had superb careers in track and field and in marathon running. Mary O'Connor. Is that John Offord, I think, running with her? John Offord wearing 31, Leicester Corritanian. Just going along with Mary O'Connor. And the crowd lifting her too. The rain has gone. Tremendous atmosphere as ever in this London Marathon. And Big Ben showing noon. A lot of vets will be amongst this group. Two hours 20 is their target. And Kirsty uh, Jakobsen from Denmark wearing F9 is the next lady home. Fifth in the 84 Marathon. Fifth in the 1985 World Cup Marathon very experienced and my word these ladies have made this look good none of them shown any signs of distress they've paced themselves well 
If the men showed the agony, well, this is the ecstasy. That's a lovely swinging gait. She really looks a superb runner. Mary O'Connor. And John Offord just having a chat, a word of encouragement. Two hours 30 coming up. It's been a fine run. So we'll look out for her. She's just near the finish now. She'll be racing over 25 laps in Edinburgh. Just shows you how good these women are because there's Mary O'Connor finishing second and just ahead of her, Don Ritchie in the um, red and white vest there. Looks like my own club vest, but uh, he's a former record holder for 1,500 100 miles on the track. You know? So this shows you what kind of athletes these women are. Well, there hasn't been much doubt now, has there, for some years? Mario Kama finishing, and uh, the race for third place should be over in just a moment. So Norway win, New Zealand second. And a race for third place between Paula Fudge and Kirsty Jakobsen. Now that was Sylvia Bonnet of France wearing F7. Not quite sure where she is on the course, but that's the French girl, Bonnet, who ran ninth in, the, uh, in last year's Chicago Marathon. Actually, it's a bit difficult to pick up who's third and who's uh, fourth, but uh, there's Paula Fudge, and we believe she's in... and just uh, coming through. And the French girl closing on her behind. F5 is Anne Ford, Paula Fudge's twin sister. Just behind her, and we believe they're in third and fourth places. Um, the French girl... Bornet. And she's the first that's looked pretty distressed. There's another race going on in the mile. Now, 18 on the back of that uh, wheelchair is Michael Cunham. 26 is John Nord, London-based uh, paraplegic, and Paula Fudge. Just coming home behind her twin sister, checking her time herself. And that may well be a personal best for Paula. Jakobsen is the girl just behind her. Well, that uh, solves the placing problem. There's Kirsty Jakobsen coming in. Uh, we think in about sixth place. Two hours, 32, 30 plus. Now, this is where the approach marshals will be bracing themselves, the pre-shoot marshals, the rope funnel marshals, the separators, the readers, the riders, and the shoot pushers plus the barcode pluckers, the spindlers and the exit marshals. This is where they all get ready for the mass. Ah, and the first man suffering from real bad cramp, trying to stretch himself out. Do it the other way, stretch the legs, don't bend them. Oh, that's tough. He's in. That's eight, seven, nine. But there's a number in front, a letter in front of it. T, we think, T879. Struggling. I think that's Gordon Reeves from Saltwell Harriers. Tiny, we're from Cranlington, your neck of the woods, Brendan. Wanted to finish in two hours 40, but he's uh, he's struggling now. Actually, that is a Saltwell vest, I think, Ron. Uh, but it's significant, isn't it? Look where he is. And we've talked about the problems that cobbles give the athletes. He's around 23 miles there, and that uneven surface, if you really 
perhaps gone too fast too soon. You pay for it there. I admitted earlier that this in the rain is tough to walk over, I tell you. It really is. Down there in the week, it's, it's pretty treacherous. And uh, But there's a few brave souls out there. Maybe the uh, early euphoria has, uh, has left them now, but this crowd has got to lift them because this is what the London Marathon is all about. It may be the only time in their lives that they'll run a marathon, and it may be uh, just one of those personal ambitions, and just to make it on the day is the first ambition. To make it home, of course, is the second ambition. Madge, Madge Sharples, there she is, back from a trip around the world. And uh, really, she turned up at the pasta party last night with half a dozen marvellous T-shirts from Hawaii, from Honolulu, from California. And she, uh, we raffled them all for charity, and £100 was made in no time. Good to see her back. I don't think the London Marathon would be the London Marathon without Mad Sharples. If the answer is no, well, my sweetness means you meet me in the hallway. Match was, uh not at halfway there and the uh, scatter of talent at the London Marathon is quite uh, astounding isn't it when you think of the gaps that develop the new cartons of water there non-spill to suck it through a straw now ladies and gentlemen this is the big finale i want everyone with their arms in the air every single one of you come on there are 19 million people watching you close the show, all right? Now, I want to prove that you're the best singers in the whole of Jamaica Road, in the whole of London, in the whole of the country. So I want you to answer this phrase, all right? Here we go. Here we go. Oggy, oggy, oggy. That's where you're at. And the police women and men are rolling down the country hillside. Oh, oh, we're calling the cats. Oh, that's it. We're flying across the All of you over there, wave your arms. Well, as we near the end of this first transmission on the 1986 marathon, a check on the placings. These are unofficial. The winner was the favourite, Seiko of Japan. In second place for Great Britain, Hugh Jones, who was the winner in 1982. Uh, third, the man who was third last year from Edinburgh Southern Harriers, Alastair Hutt. In fourth place, the American Pat Peterson. In fifth place from Turkey, Tertzi. And in sixth place, the fastest ever West German, Christoph Hurler. By the way, that's a provisional result, and this also provisional for the uh, 1986 Mars London Marathon women's result. The winner, Greta Weitz, had time to be confirmed yet, what we believe inside two hours, 25 minutes. In second place, Mary O'Connor of New Zealand. And third, Anne Ford of Great Britain. So as we look around now, the uh, sights. The carnival in full swing at Jamaica Road, just before Tower Bridge. That's the embankment with the athletes now some uh, two to three miles from the finish. And it looks like a record number of finishes. So the men's marathon won by uh, Seiko of Japan. 